What's up, everyone? Tonight, we're live with Roger Kramer from Blue Tongue Morphs, and we're here with Dave Levinson, the help co-host. How are you both doing tonight? Yeah, great. Fantastic. Good to see you, Dave. I've seen you on a lot of podcasts. So this is my first one. I sort of shy away from the camera a fair bit. No, I get that. It's it's kind of fun though, man. Um, I was talking to a couple of people recently about podcasts. How it's really where people are getting their information. They don't read like they used to. Um, you know, I find it beneficial. You know, good discussions. Yeah, definitely. A lot of times when you have emails and and texts, it get it gets misrepresented. People don't understand what you're saying. So, yeah, it's good. <clears throat> All right, Alex, do your thing, bud. So let's, we'll jump right into it then. So what has the last 30 years in the hobby been like and how did you get from there to now? Well, when I first started, um, was probably 93, 94. You probably weren't born then, Alex, but yeah, it was about 93 and, um, everything was wild. There was no, no, no morphs had been discovered. And there was a huge push for locality animals. So everyone was just had locality animals. There was no laws, there was no licensing. Um, and then in 2000, uh, 1995, 96, we'd heard that there was an albino discovered. Uh, it went to the reptile park and then they had a fire and, and apparently perished. And then another chap in Newcastle found a few albinos in his backyard. So he donated those to the park. And then by 2004, 2005, they had started breeding them and made them available to the public. And because there was such a huge demand on them, I had to wait five years to get my first albino and now I'm the biggest albino breeder in the world. So you can do it. You can catch up. Um, same with the hypers. They were found in 2006. And um, same story, you know, all the morphs so far, except I don't know about the northerns, they had all been found in, in backyards. So they survived in areas where they probably wouldn't have survived in the wild. They had protection, same with the pie that was discovered in 2020. It was living around a pool under a pool housing in the Hunter Valley. So they've all been fairly protected. So if they had been in the wild, I think a lot of them wouldn't be in the industry today. So it's it's been good. And uh, after the morphs were discovered, I was always just breeding locality types, $25 at a at a local show that's all you could get for them no one wanted blue tongues it was like bringing an old holden to a, a car a car exhibition no one wanted to, no one wanted them and uh even the slightest hint of you interbreeding them with northerns and that yeah you, know, you were shunned and, and uh savaged on all the social media because they used to call them mutts they'd say you know you're creating hybrids so people shied away from it. But then when they found the white northern, I managed to get two males from the guy who had them. And he said he'd line bred them. So looking at animals, looking at species, having done a lot of genetic genetics in the orchids, I used to breed orchids and fish. Um, I, I wasn't buying it, they were lined. But what I did, the two males, I put over 16 eastern females. And the rest is history. I proved out that not only were they um, recessive, but by producing the platinum from the hyper and the white, we produced the silver animal, which proved that they were co-dominant as well. Because I actually wanted to produce a, something that looked like a panda or a, or an orca. I even had the name orca pop picked out for it. And then when I produced this silver animal, I thought, well, they're definitely co-dominant. Well, so that's that, and that's where we started. And um, from there, the anneries were discovered in a, in a Kimberley form and then more anneries were found. And 
Bitbo and then um, a couple of other breeders got involved and I posted that they were a northern eastern cross and I got savaged a little bit, but then nobody else wanted anything else but them and the market just exploded with them. And to this day, very there's very few people breeding pure Easterns because of the... Uh, the lack of vigor, um, and also they're not, Easterns are not really designed as a as an indoor pet because they need such cold conditions. So the northern with the warm and the cool, they were the perfect pet. And uh, like I said, the rest is history. Now everything that people want from me is, is the intergrade or the, I call them intergrades because they're not, even though they're listed as subspecies, if you travel up the coast, you'll see how slowly they diverge into the next type of locality type and eventually get what you call the pure northern and the pure eastern. So well, I'm, I'm sure they, you know, naturally in the wild they're going to integrate so it's you know like i think you said before more of a natural variance than an actual hybrid yeah they won't like if you get the most uh, southern form of syncoides and if you get the most northern form of intermedia yeah they won't look anything alike but the slow progression up the coast you'll see the integrates and you, there's even um what they call the North Queensland Easterns. So they've even listed them as an Eastern, yet they behave more like a Northern. Yeah, and from there I, I decided because I was getting such a demand for them, I, I created Blue Tongue Morphs because that's all I wanted to do. I would never saw myself as a stationary arc. I said that's for the parks and, and other... Um, educational institutions I'm here to produce pets I've never shied away from that I've always been honest and um, transparent my whole purpose of producing it is like the bird people they produce animals that are strong colorful and what the public is demanding from me and and that's and now you look at the industry and it's yeah blue tongues are everywhere everyone wants them so why do you think back then that you know at first they were only twenty five dollars and no one wanted them? Well, it's like the green budgery go. If you go out even today out into the desert, there'll be flocks of twenty five million green budgery guys. No one's going to spend time and go out and get a green budgery gar when you have you know fifty or sixty morphs or color variants of of them which are far more attractive to the human eye because people want beautiful things you know women with their jewelry men with their cars you know everybody wants something that's attractive and the easterns and, and the northerns their patterning is designed to protect them in the wild you know the banding is because they lay under sh small shrubs the banding looks like the shadowing of the shrubs and unless they move, a lot of times I've walked straight past them. I live in an area where the Easterns are all around me. I see them in my yard every day. So they're, nat they're naturally occurring here. And as the seasons change, you'll see them less or more, depending on the temperature. And that's why I wanted to, to sort of focus on what I think is a misconception about the, the pure Easterns and how low they can get, it gets down to minus four. I've had them at minus one and they're fine. Um, they survive, they come out, they, they walk like staccato style because they're so stiff and cold, but they'll come out and they'll um, brewmate in the wintertime and they'll come out and sun themselves when it's a hot day in the wintertime. So... Sometimes I see people saying, oh, yeah, we switch the whole room off, we switch the lights off. That's not how they, how they exist in the wild. They come out in the winter to, broom, uh, to sun themselves. And that's why, particularly with some of the colder regions, the eye banding is very, very prominent 
And when I've studied them in the wild, Mount Gibraltar is, is a place where it gets down to minus two. You'll see them with their little heads sticking out of, of their burrow or rock pile. And all you'll see is the perennial eye and the, um, and the eye band out. Then they've got that blood mass in their, in their skull where they heat up the, the blood and they pump it through their body and then they go back inside. They usually come out about 11, 12 o'clock. They're back inside by 2 o'clock. And you never see their whole body. So one of the things that I need to educate people on is actually how cold they need to be. And um, if you want, I can detail what, like last time Dave was on one of the podcasts, he says not much research being done. I think it's just a lot of the research is in scientific journals and in uh, private hands, but there's been a lot of research done. And just like yourself, Dave and, and Alex, um, we don't have it all our own way either with breeding, you know, you know 50, 60, 70% at best. If I had 100% in my breeding every year, the market would be flooded in two years because I do 150 to 170 pairings every year. And um, that's what I'm saying. If, if they all survived or they all fell pregnant or gravid, the market would be uh, saturated in three or four years. Um, so your number at 50 or 60% uh, percent success rate, um, you know, a lot of big breeders here have talked about the similar or similarities in their collection about that same success rate. Why do you think that is with that species? I um, mean, you know, there's been a lot of other species I've worked with other people where you kind of crack the code on the why. Why do you think this is with this species? Well, until recently, it, it got to me where I thought, you know, this is, this is, there's something wrong. Surely in the wild, they don't um, have such a low success rate. So I contacted a couple of scientists that had actually studied um, the percentage of gravid females in the wild, and they said it's not uncommon for many males in the wild not to be successful, and females will be bred by numerous males, and I've seen that myself. Yeah, you know, there'll be three, four males chasing after a girl. So even if one of them only becomes successful, um, it's still it's still a successful pairing. The other thing that um, was looked into was why do they actually brew mate? And my my when I produce the babies, I never I don't brew mate them over the first season because you want them to continuously grow. Whereas in the wild, the babies brew mate and they take up to four and some even five years to reach maturity. That's in the Easterns we're talking about. Um, so what I wanted to see was what does the brumation actually do? And scientists had already investigated that and, fa and found that they started to measure the male um, uh, with females, they measured the follicle size. With the males, they measured the testicle length and depth. And when I looked at the research figures, it showed me exactly that where the testicles are at their massive maximum size and volume was the time mine were up and running around looking for girls. And when they measured them in, which is here, August to sep middle of September, which is just after their winter brumation, and the lowest testicle size and volume was in October, November. So then they measured them again in March and found that there was, they the virtually shriveled up, let's call it. And they gave all the measurements of, of testicle size and that. So I thought, right, that means that the the brumation and the temperature increase triggers a hormone to start absorbing or producing the the sperm. So we thought, all right, the next stage we'll go to is let's have a look at um, the volume. 
like I've had males like my platinum male, which I've got here. Um, he did 14 girls and had 10 litters. I've got other males like the golden snows. He'll do one female and the second female nothing. We'll only have one litter. So, again, the scientists had already investigated that as well. And their hypothesis is that in the pre brumation season, the males actually produce all their sperm, but it's in an inactive stage. So let's use an arbitrary figure of 100 mil. Certain males might produce 100 mil, others 50. So I thought, okay, so obviously the brumation is a trigger for, and they called it meiosis or mitosis, where the sperm actually then once they heat up, uh, it actually then starts to become fertile. And when I did my pairings, I said, okay, if that's the case, let's just do one pairing. If this male's only got enough sperm for five females, if I put him over one female three times, then he's only going to do one and a half females. And once we started doing that, it showed one good lock at the right time we had litters. So our most valuable males will only get one, one lock with a female. And I've taken records and in my stud books, I've put how many successful litters males have had. So I've got a log book of all my males and how many litters they fathered. And I've seen a trend that there's some of the morphs that, um, that I've created that have a high volume of sperm, whereas there's others that have a very low volume. Now, people say to me, oh, no, but you've got to do them three or four times because what if, you know, he didn't. And then when we looked at the data from uh, the scientific research on the testicle size, even though they're awake and running around, some of them didn't initiate the, the, the production of the sperm until they'd been out two or three weeks, whereas others three or four days. So what we started to think about is, okay, We'll let this male mate this female. We'll take a swab of, of the residue that, because they sometimes squirt as well as you've seen, um, or there's residue on the male and the female, and then look at them under a microscope. And a lot of the time, there was no active sperm after he'd made it. So in the future, because this only happened with a colleague of mine last year, so this season after they've made we're going to take swabs of every single pairing and see if they actually inseminated the femur with with viable sperm and that may then increase the um the percentage of, of pos you know, positive matings now it's it's a hypothesis that, that they've had and they're they're working still working on it but it seems to make sense um, when I see some of my males um, having done three matings and those first three matings, nothing. And then when he gets to the fourth or fifth mating, you have, you have successful litters. Now, that could also be something that has something to do with females. And here again, we look at the female range and temperatures. So... I see a lot of the breeders, because they want to get the males active, they start pumping the temperatures into them. Now, here in um, the area I live in, where there's an abundance of easterns, that they'll be mating at seven and eight degrees. And, you know, people are, are pump, bumping the, the temperatures up to 35 degrees and wondering why they're only active for one or two weeks. My males will stay active for six weeks and some females even longer, sometimes two months, because they're held at lower temperatures. And when we study them in the wild as well, after they mate, the females go underground. If they've had a successful mating, they don't want any males near them and you'll see them bury themselves for over a month. They won't come out for a month. 
And I believe that's the time where they're just resting. They're allowing the, um, the sperm to interact with the follicles and then they, they start to come out and bask. Um, and I've seen that in my indoor populations as well. Um, once I mate, they then go under their hides most of the time because I won't bump up their, their temperatures through heat lights or anything. I rather let, because I'm living in their environment, I'm letting the, the natural lighting in, uh, conditions and the heat that I've got through my bus, not, not basking lights, they're just, just visual lights and uh the, the the rooms will warm up and you'll see them coming out after about three four weeks to constantly bark. if you put a heat light in there though they'll come out a lot earlier and this is where a lot of the northern collections like in queens and that they'll have 80 percent males in their in their litters whereas i get 80 percent females so we looked at that data as well and like the geckos, I firmly believe by keeping them under the, the, you know, the 18, even under 15 degrees for that first month, you'll produce 80% girls. And so in my production, I, I can either get skew my production male heavy or female heavy, providing they fall gravid. Now, the, I know the geckos and the alligators and that do it down to the last degree type of thing. But I found that keeping them under 15 degrees at night time and about 22 during the day, I get a higher proportion of females. And that's what everyone wants. It's not correct that they, that they always want females and not enough males. But um, in our, when, when, when I'm selling animals, that's what people want. They want majority females. And then in the hotter seasons, like if you're heating them up to 35 to mate and to, to bask in those early stages, they get majority males, very few females. And nature protects itself. It doesn't give you 100%. It'll give you a, sort of an 80% ratio. So they're the things we've worked on to try and make um, the production better. But the problem is Australian... Um, mammals, Australian um, reptiles are heavily um, in, in, like involved in the, uh, the climatic conditions. Even the bird breeders have said this year has been a shocking year. Um, they're very much skewed towards the climatic conditions and like the kangaroos, they can reabsorb or hold joeys and, and not have them... Um, develop um other animals will just not breed and this year's been very low percentage with a lot of with a lot of breeders which i suppose good to ha having a recession at the moment but um yeah you, you just haven't had the no conditions have changed nothing's changed but the results aren't as good so, oh well, let's do it first. You do it first, bud. So I was just going to mention for everyone that doesn't know uh, Celsius, when he was talking, that 60 Fahrenheit at night and about 72 during the day, which is, I know, at least for me, you know, a bit colder than I keep mine. But I do get yeah, it it's a pure northern and northern temperatures are different um but because i made the intergrades um i sort of try and go in between um with with the pure easterns that like i said they'll made at seven degrees um not these 35 and 38 degrees that you see listed if you heat them at 38 degrees, the males will be jumping out of their tubs, yeah, wanting to mate, but they'll only last a week, maybe a week and a half, and then they're finished because they think it's summertime. They think it's too late to mate now. Our babies won't um, be big enough to to make it through the next winter, and that's 
that's the decisive factor here in Australia. Everything is there for a reason. So the animals look at how, you know, it's built into them evolutionary-wise that they need to have those babies strong enough and big enough to make it through the winter. They lose up to 70% of their body mass producing litters and some don't make it after it. Um, so it's it's a massive toll on the females to produce litters and they won't produce them. Sometimes they'll only produce one litter every three years and it all depends on their body mass after the summer. So the next thing is I see a lot of people trying to pump food into them after they've mated. Some of my females won't mate until two months after they've dropped won't eat, sorry, until two months after they've dropped the litter, whereas others might start eating after they come out of that, that hiding phase after they've made it. So I always encourage my buyers and, and people who contact me, you've got to make sure that the animals are up to weight before they go into brumation because here my animals go into brumation end of April and they might not eat until November. So not only are they having the burden of a, a litter of 18, 19 bubs, but they also um, aren't eating. They come out regularly during brumation and drink. They always drink, so make sure you've always got water. Um, and they, they, they pee. They won't poop because they've got nothing in their digestive system, but they'll pee, pee a lot even while they're brew mining. So that's why they don't, they don't call it a hibernation because they are active during those periods. And there'll be days when it gets hot um, compared to the other days of winter and they'll be out. You know, you'll see them lying on their hides and that. So they don't completely hibernate. That's why they term it brumation. So you've never had anything with food intake post-breeding that affected your ovulations? The animals that, um, like if you have a really poor eating female, and I know there's a big push, like there always is with people, to breed animals quickly, to have a return on their investment. I find my best litters are from three-year-old females. And when I say three-year-old females, I mean three seasons. They're two and a half years old. Um, anything before that is taxing on the animal. And people might not realise that initially, but the longevity of females, like I can show you this girl. This is one of my original platinum girls, all right? She's 15 years old now. She had a litter last season and she's only had probably four litters in her lifetime. Females that I've seen that are bred season after season, if they even drop any babies, they don't live very long. It is very taxing on their system. Females that have never bred for me, my oldest one, because it was a het and sort of the, the morph race overtook her, she's 22 years old. She's never seen the sun, which I don't advocate as a practice, but having so many animals... I found that good diet, you know, good, clean living conditions, they, you can get away with not giving them UV. And she's 22. She's never seen the sun and she's never bred because I haven't wanted to breed her. She's a pet and um, as, strong, as strong as a bull, you know. So if you want something that, you want long term, minimize the breeding of a female. Males are different, you know, they, they don't put that much effort into it. So, um, yeah, you've got to get them up to a good weight. And I always say over 600 grams. I would never breed anything under 600. A lot of my girls, because they've got the northern end, are 1,025, yeah, 900. They're all around the 950, 960 gram mark. Um, and they'll produce big litters, 17, 18, big, healthy babies. The babies are usually about 25 grams. 
So, um, and if something looks a, a little meagre or a little thin, I won't breed her for that season. Yet I see, I constantly see people breeding them at seven and eight months. That, that That's just, for me, and this is my opinion, it's just unethical. They don't do it in the wild. They don't get up that size that quickly. And then they have problems with bone density issues and they blame it on the UV. It's not that. You've pushed them that fast that you'll see misshapen heads, misshapen bodies, um, and they say, oh, yeah, that's normal. She'll grow into that. Like It's just ludicrous. But everyone has their own judgments. I do what I think is ethical and... I'm not in a space race. I'm, I, I started the morphs here in Australia and, yeah, I'm not – I've produced stuff like I've got a Calypso here that no one's ever produced, which is a platinum albino. I've got five or six morphs that no one's ever produced, but I can't do every morph because when I do a project, I'll hold the whole litters back. So I've got four gene – golden snow times platinums and i've got 75 animals that i've had to keep back so those 75 animals are in you know 1200 long 30 centimeter wide tanks so you can see a whole room is just um devoted to them uh so if you've got 50 projects going, you'll need an acre, an acre property just to, to do four or five projects. Now, there's other people who are doing patentless and whatnot. I look at the ones that my market wants and they're the ones that I produce. So I, I find it sometimes a bit disheartening when they say, oh, yeah, he's better than you or he's better than him and... I'm not interested in that. I choose projects which I feel have the best merit for the market, what I enjoy seeing, and I'm not going to do every morph because it's just impossible. You'd need a massive, massive uh, uh, facility for that. Mine's big enough already. So, yeah, I, I concentrate on colour. I want to produce um, blue a blue blue tongue one day um i've got you know animals that have blue legs and that but it's a long way off i probably won't live that long but someone can take over um i want to produce pure reds uh pure yellows with red eyes i'm nearly there they're very very close uh, and they're things that i enjoy I, I love genetics it's just great and before i venture into a project i want to see what the effects are like the anary gene pulls color out except for yellow and to produce the golden snows we produced a pure almost a pure yellow anary male and he's he's the he has the black eyes and all that but he's he's yellow and um he was the the basis of our golden snows now everyone's racing for trying the nespex thing the newest Thing on the market we haven't even scratched the surface here in australia and we've been working on them what now 20 years we haven't even scratched the surface with morphs because what i'm noticing now is by reintroducing say a snow back onto an albino which is multi-gene you're producing an animal that doesn't even uh, resemble the original base albino and we're getting so many variations of of the morphs um, just by stacking genes onto them. And that's where my interest lies. And anything that I have, and I take pride in what I do and I love my animals and I just won't sell to anybody. So if a 10-year-old child comes and says, I want one of your Calypsos or whatever, I say to the parent, look, it, it's, it's a designer animal. It's very rare. I think he needs to start off with something that's that's like a, a het or something like that. And then there's people I won't sell to because I don't think their keeping is ethical. And I don't need the money from the Blue Tongues, although they've been very kind to me, very kind. 
Um, I'll never give up my day job because um, I have reduced it a lot, but I'll never give that up because you need the interaction with people. The blue tongues don't talk to you. You know, after a while, you just have to get out of there because they drive you nuts. So, yeah, for me, it's the passion with the genetics to see what each of the genes will do. And with the anneries, they'll pull all the colour out. Yeah, you'll get these beautiful whites like an anery, uh, a whitehead anery um, will be the most brilliant white, not a mark on them, but they suffer through anneries, reduce the size of animals. So the, why is that? It's just something about the genetics of an anery. It's like... Um, albinos you know put that they have issues with sensory problems like they can't after two or three years their vision is impaired they have issues with all their sensory abilities so like i have a whole room there's probably 250 albinos of all different sizes and different colors i've got the reds the yellows the oranges the purple all different albinos, but they all will suffer the same sort of um, sensory deprivation, if you like to call it that. So people say, oh, we have problems breeding them. No one will sell an albino male. I breed all my albino males. And maybe on this podcast, if people are interested, I, I can tell them the secret to that. And it's not temperature. Some people well, say, oh, what is it? Well, because they don't, it's like... Um, having a blind man trying to find the door. If you tap on the door, he'll know where to go. If you just leave him to wander around aimlessly, he'll never find his way. So what I looked at with the, with the albinos and albino type morphs is, yeah, they can't see, but they have, they still can feel vibrations. So when I, and some are more severe than others. So when um, I, I mate them all on the uh, the carp, you know, the artificial grass, I don't know what they call it in America. It's just the artificial green grass. Yeah, turf. turf yeah, it's artificial turf. And um, with the female, when I introduce the females to the male's cage, I'll scratch the carpet near her. And you'll straight away see him flick his tongue and walk over to her. Now, sometimes that's enough to get him to start biting her. But other times, um, I actually scratch when he walks over. I tease him till he opens his mouth and I actually latch him onto the female. And he'll hang on. And you might have to do that four, five, six times. And eventually he'll go through the process, which is, you know, throwing her around, um, biting hard on her. Um, doing the whole process and then having that still moment, as I call it, uh, where they just contemplate the next move and then you'll see them swing over and scratch the tail and up up it goes. Now, they have very good fertility, all the blue tongue, all the uh, albinos. Very, very good fertility. But it's just the sensory deprivation because of the, the recessiveness of their genes which allows them not to find things or, or see things, even their food, you know, most of the time you have to put it near them. So all my, like I said, all my males breed. Sometimes really aggressive females will make him breed because she'll go and bite him on the side or have a go at him and then he'll, he'll latch onto her. But those ones that are really um, poor maters, poor breeders, I latch them onto the females or the, the carpet scratching works for them. But you can't give up straight away, you know. Sometimes it'll take a few days. Sometimes it'll take a week before he really masters it. And um, what I've found also is in the early days, the albinos were inbred too much. Like at Snake Ranch, they threw them in the pit and pretty much they were so inbred that they that they wouldn't breed and people didn't experiment with with the techniques that I used. So any of the multiple gene albinos I find very easy because the added, say, hypo or the added uh, melanistic 
gives them a little bit more vigor. And like I said, with the morphs, um, by, by adding layers of genes onto them, you're producing animals that look completely different. So what I tried to get done here is get people or laboratories to do the genetic testing. I know it's taken off in America and people are, some people are angry about it, saying, you know, it's going to wreck the markets. Some are favourable. With blue tongues, because you might not only breed them once every three years or so, um, it would be invaluable for me. But it's 25000 a shed, and um, that's a lot of money to invest when our market is so small. But, yep. I, you know, sometimes it's taken me four years to prove out, prove out a 3-4 gene animal. So that's where... And then what happens is people produce a white and say, oh, yeah, it's such and such and such. It's only guess. They haven't proved it out. They haven't bred it to prove it out. So we've got all these animals out on the market being sold as something which they potentially may not be. And this is where the, the industry is doing a disservice to itself by this speed and rush like we've got to be the first to to stand up on the pedestal they're not doing the research into what they've actually produced and um that's where my interest lies is i will breed where the possibilities are only that you can't get anything else you know when you're getting up to the the five gene animals you've got 32 possibilities and anything over two and three gene, if you've used high, the super hypos, as I call them, the pure whites into it, they'll all be white with red eyes. So how I, I did a, a, a test one day. I put six animals up, all looked the same or very similar. They're all white, had red eyes, yet they're all different genetics. And I asked people to identify each of them. They got them all, they all got them wrong. So if you're selling moon glows on the market, if you're selling sun glows on the market, you have to know what the genetics to produce that was that um, made no other possibility possible. And there's going to be a lot of people that are going to get very badly stung here in Australia um, because, and you see them up for sale all the time because they haven't proved out. So... It's a long journey, and I'm si I am was 63 yesterday, and, um, you know, I've been doing this since I was, what, 35 or whatever, and we haven't, like I said, we haven't even scratched the surface with them, and we've got all the the uh, the animals here. Like in America, you, you do all the line breeding and that, and you've got some magnificent colours over there, which... Uh, which is bad for us because we have so many morphs that oh, we're not going to waste our time line breeding. You know, we can get instant colour and people have become lazy, whereas you don't have any other choice. So, you, like, I, I've seen some magnificent colours over there um, with the reds and the oranges and things like that, which, you know, if plugged into some of our morphs would be amazing. But, you know, we haven't invested the time because we've been spoiled with all the other stuff. Yeah, um, I mean, you're definitely right. And we talk about this a lot that, you know, we're limited to what we have. So we do the best of what we got. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I even said if I could even pick one mutation out of Australia, I'd probably want to go after something like a T positive because we have so many <laughs> different colors already with flying breeding our northerns. Having a T positive would be beneficial for about a new project. <laughs> Um, but you know, not to hog the mic, but you know, when you talk about your 30 years in the hobby and just like the progression in Australia for you, um, you know, that was really no different than what happened in the United States. There was an albino that encouraged people to focus more on breeding mutations when they were focused on locality stuff, whatever species it was. Um, you know, the same thing, like you said, with the rat race in ball pythons, um, you know, Graziani talks about how when he got his first mutation, which was a pastel, he spent six years raising the male up where now we've learned in ball pythons that if you feed them properly, there's guys that have had males lock in at 45 days, somewhere between that and six months. So, you know, as it becomes more competitive, there's more colors and there's, like you said, the rat race, 
you know, again, it just kind of happens. Even to what you're talking about, the shed test and the golden ball pythons was a blue ball python. And that was thought to be a super cinnamon banana, but the color didn't do as supposed to. So a lot of similar goals that we've had here that you guys had there. Um, you know, I find it very fascinating the way the species work there because, you know, blue tongue skinks here have not really been a mainstream species and they may never be something mainstream like they are for you guys. You know, I compare what you guys do probably more to like our ball pythons here, even with the testing and everything else that, you know, the time that goes into it for you guys. Um, but, you know, it's really fascinating, like I said, just how it's progressed there because it's been almost a mirror image of what we've had here in our industry. Well, the problem is all the current base morphs, except I don't know about the northern, they're all found, like I said, in a protected area and they're all single animals. Like every hypermelanistic in the world is descended from one female that was found in Bondi Junction uh, in Bondi um, by Dr. Rick Shine. And it was donated to the Taronga Zoo where they put it onto a normal male, uh, het, just a normal wild het male. And then all the progeny went to Snake Ranch and the rest is history. So the pied is the same. There's only one found a male found in a backyard. There's probably no populations of them anywhere except for this one animal that's now being propagated by a number of people. Um, so inbreeding of these, these morphs, with the albinos, there's about five that were discovered, so they're not as uh, singular as these others. But with all the others, it's imperative to continually keep outbreeding them to get the vigour into them. So what happened when uh, the original ones were released to snake ranch, they put them in a pit and they didn't do very well. So my understanding is they were all sent to um, North Queensland to be bred there because they did better under the warmer conditions. And then they were sent down to snake ranch to, to distribute through the through the hobby and i didn't know this and i've put my yeah it's an eastern it's a hyper melanistic eastern it's got the dark color i was putting them at you know 10 and 8 degrees and I, I lost the first three and i thought what the hell's going on and then i spoke to another chap who and this is why these podcasts are so important where people interact and exchange ideas is he said oh no i've got it on a on a heat mat and uh in the winter it chooses where it wants to go i don't drop it under 18 degrees and i said well that's not typical eastern and then later i found that they were breeding them all up in cairns so how the one in bondo because it gets fairly cold there it gets fairly cold there survived if it was in a, a backyard they find concrete they find areas where they can hide and um once I started increasing the heat on the hypermelanistics, they just went crazy. Um, never had a problem with them ever again. The only problem was, and again, because you're, you've got a, a descendants of one animal, they had the, the cloudy eye syndrome, which even Joe Ball went and took it to a vet and they said it was a virus. And that virus is passed on genetically. There's nothing you can do about it. And I thought if it's passed on genetically, let's try and um, do it in such a way that after so many outbreedings, the effect of that cloudiness or the virus is minimal in its effect. And it took me five years to do, but my line of hypers are the most popular because I first put them through Northerns, I put them through the Marebas. Um, now, I don't have any of mine have the cloudy eye syndrome at all, but they're not pure Eastern. But people don't care because they don't want their animal with one eye cloudy and going blind. Um, they want an animal that's big, robust and healthy. So I know in America they still talk about, you know, purity and, you know, like Carl and we're not going to cross them. But then I see Ron St. Pierre, he's doing the right thing. He's introducing other genetics because um he's going to produce animals that the market will want because they're healthy they're robust 
And people say, oh, yeah, but we've only got, you know, a certain line of northerns. And if you look on my web page, what I always describe to people is this. Once you take a natural northern out of its habitat and plonk it into your glass mountain, as I call it, you are taking away all the factors that determine evolution of that particular population. You're taking away the predators, you're taking away the food source that they have, and you're determining who they mate with. So all those factors either keep a population evolving like they are with minimal differences, or if you take that all those factors away, you're creating, in effect, a hybrid, like a geographic hybrid, if you like to call it that. My wife's Maltese, I'm German, and my kids aren't hybrids. I don't see them as hybrids. Yet people say, oh, no, but that's a northern, this is an eastern, and this is an Irian Joe, and this is this. We aren't a stationary arc. I'm not a stationary arc. I don't claim to be. And the biggest problem is if you look at the biodiversity dynamics, in order not to inbreed an animal, they have the 5500 rule, which you've already, I reckon you would have seen many a time, Dave and, and Alex, where they're saying you have to have a minimum of 50 individuals to be able to stop inbreeding and requirement for that population to exist is 500. Now, I don't know how many animals went into the states um, initially, but they've probably already reached it. Some of them have reached conditions where they're starting to get very badly inbred um, and they need new blood all the time. And what I try to do is give the customer um, the best the best animal that you can. Like I'd never put a, a, a blotchy over because to me they are distinct evolved species like blotchies, ossipetalis, the multifasciatas. They're all been uh, segregated from each other for such a period of time they've actually speciated. Still on the same island, but Australia is a massive island. Um, and they don't come into contact with each other. So they have speciated, whereas the Easterns and the Northerns to me are still the same same species and people say, oh, yeah, this is a subspecies. If I show people babies that um, are from the, the closest um, habitats, they can't tell the difference. And this is the thing, and, and this is why I get annoyed with the white northern because what happened was with the white northerns um john robert cowd had them in a pit and kept throwing whites and i bought two males from him and i wanted to buy some more in like a few years later and this was about 2009 and he said no nah. he said people are harassing me i i don't want to be in this anymore you know they told me to sell them all and my prices are too dear blah 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 and i said oh, it's unfortunate i'll just have to work with the two males i've got now they were already in the hobby but they had very very poor sperm viability and you've pro you would, would have seen at the time there was websites i oh, yeah, put white to white and uh, nothing or they had all slugs and so I said, well, there's two things I want to prove with this, that it's not been lion bred, that it's a recessive. So I, like I said before, put it over all the females and I produced all hets in the first generation, as you would expect. But I put it over Eastern because I wanted better sperm viability. And um, those 16 girls, I think at about nine or 10 had litters and they all had the risk you know they all produced white like the percentages of white babies so i proved that it was recessive and all those people that had hammered me and attacked me they suddenly disappeared now it's a well-known fact they're recessive then on like i said before when i produced the platinum i also proved that they were um 
the co-dominant as well. So I thought, well, how do I disseminate because I wanted the complete transparency? How do I disseminate a pure northern, which the, they had pretty much died out in the hobby, and a, a white northern cross, a uh, white eastern northern cross? So I call them super hypos, which I got blasted for because it sort of portrayed the idea that it was a dominant genetic, which I never, ever said. But my that's why I list them as super hypos. The pure northerns, there's there's probably a, only 2%, if even that, in the hobby. Yet everyone out there is calling them white northerns. So I wrote it an article where I, I gave all the history of it. And um, the only way that that you can convince people is through genetic testing because I've got sheds from the pure and from the, the, the cross northerns. So then once all the multiple gene ones were created, my platinum line is the basis of every multiple gene animal here in Australia because to get because that was the stepping stone. I had, was the only one who produced the platinum. The other people had snows. They didn't have the bridge to make the four gene stuff. So I sold one of my original female, which is a sister to that 14-year-old, 15-year-old one there, and she was paired to a, um, a snow to produce seven het, four gene hats. And again, the rest is history. But every white northern, or the ones that you are calling white northerns, are descendants from my animals. There was a line where the alabasters were produced from that came from a northern line, white northern. But they've been bred through my lines as well. So I'm pretty much convinced, except for the two males I've still got, which are close to 20-something years old, they're the only pure white northerns, yet the industry has taken it upon themselves to call everything a white northern, which is incorrect. And now I see in America they're calling them ivories and whatnot. So it's really pointless in, in and that's the, the, the sad part of this industry. There's really no point giving something a name. Like I, I name it a Calypso because it's a platinum Albano. It looked like a Calypso ice cream when I was young. Um, and I can show you what it looks like now, um, but it, um, someone in America or in Germany or whatever could next week produce one and call it something else, you know, and, and people will just accept that. So the colour's not, it's like a, a real creamy yellow. So he's got the red, the red eyes and, and, and the, the pink tongue. So he's a he's an albino. He's a visual three gene animal. You look like you want to ask some, Dave. Oh well, by the way, Alex, this we're gonna do. If you got something, just put your hand up a little bit. I'll put this up so we know when we're jumping in. Okay. I've got like fifteen or twenty things, but um, right, let's stay on the whites for a second because you know that is kind of relevant because, like you said, that's something that's now in America. Um, you know, became readily available over the last three or four years um so in your opinion then so you believe that everything you guys are working over there the idea of a pure northern is non-existent so would you say that more than likely the stock that we would have here for the ivory project is more than likely a eastern northern cross at some point or do you think there's a chance it might have just been a pure northern when it got here well the the easiest way to say that is with the het if they're producing het babies um they have eye bands Pure Northerns don't have eye bands, um, which is an evolutionary trait that they've dispensed with because it gets very hot up the north. They're, they have 40 degree, 40 C uh, day times, and they still go down to 10 in the winter time. but they can recharge their batteries during the day. So their need for the eye bands is irrelevant. So as you know, with evolution, irrelevancy means it disappears after a while. The eastern, so that they don't get predated, they have the eye bands and the, the tip of their head only sticks out where they can get the necessary charge to their batteries in the middle of the wintertime. 
Now, I'm, I'm not saying there aren't any around, but they will be few and far between. And what happens here is um, we have a department, Department of the Environment, they issue... So no one here in Australia owns their reptiles. They can come tomorrow and take them all off you. That's how severe our laws are. So the licence you get is called a licence, is a reptile keeper's licence. The state and the and the world and the country owns your animals, even though they've never been in the wild, never came from the wild. A New South Wales state where I live owns my animals, and if they want, they can come in tomorrow with their posse and take them all off me. And uh, because of that, uh, they issue the license. Now every year we have to in end of March we have to submit what we've bred, what's died, what's escaped, what we've sold, all on a, a spreadsheet, which is a massive job. And I guarantee with the limited staff they have there, which is very limited, they'll probably never ever look at it. Um, but we still have to put it in. So what happens then is um, we go to shows, like, you know, the expos, we'll set up a table and we have to demand that whoever we sell it to is a, a licensed reptile keeper. We can't sell to anyone that's not a licensed reptile keeper. So I'll get some Asian, Korean, Chinese. He'll say, I'm going to buy all your table. I say, have you got a license? Yep, here's the license. Here's my address. Here's... So people say, well, some of these animals have ended up in China or Korea or whatever. That's not my... That's not up to me. It's up to the department that has issued that licence to that gentleman or that lady. Like, I'm not the police. I can't be racist and say, oh, just because you look Korean, I can't sell to you. Yeah, you don't want to do that. You can't. Like, in America would be even more so because here in Australia there's, you know, um, there's not as many uh, ethnic groups. Um, but what happens is... What you're going to say? No, you can't. I can't sell to you because you look Asian. So this is where the biggest problem has come. Um, they'll say, "I'm buying your table. Here's fifty, hundred thousand dollars. I want to buy everything you've got." And you say, "Well, he's got his license. I register that license. I put the license in with my return. Then it's up to the department to to police that. It's not up to me." So. With your ivories, as you asked, Dave, I would suspect that they found their way over there somehow, <laughs> but not because we've put them in a in a ice cream tin or a, a chip tin and, and shipped them out. We've sold them legally at an expo, or someone will ring me up and say, "I want fifty hypers." Here's my license. Why would I say no? Um, this well, I think it's common knowledge. Um, you know, I mean, we understand, like, you know, the albino um, carpet python is a good example. You know, it's something that just ended up here. Uh, we all know things happen. Maybe we don't all know how it happened. Yeah, but we understand say, it, but it might not because there is a law, there is a, um, a, a ruling where animal sanctuaries and zoos are permitted to trade with other animal sanctuaries and zoos overseas. So the, the carpet pythons may have found their way over there through a zoo. Now, here in Australia, zoos and reptile parks that aren't allowed to sell to the public or engage with the public. They can do it with other zoos, but not the public. So the way the reptile park originally got around that was to create a business on the site called Snake Ranch. And then they used park animals to breed and distribute through to the, to the industry, which, came, which worked well. Um, there were a lot of keepers that used to get shirty about it, but that, that's the way it was. And it gave us access to animals. Um, but... The other side of these things finding their way overseas, um, there's the the way I just described, and there there are obviously ways that they shouldn't have gone. 
Um, but again, that's not up to me. I'm producing morphs for our for our market, and if someone gives me a license, a valid license, which I can check with the department, then why wouldn't I be uh, obligated to sell to that person? So that that's just one of the things with like you are calling it an ivory, which what's the point of having any name on it? Tomorrow someone could call it a, a bloody you know, avalanche or, you know, this is where mm -hmm. it becomes a bit messy because eventually there'd be so much confusion. And I think you had the same with the ball pythons where you had, um, you know, the ones that, uh, the, the, the one that they call the bananas and um, chorus as well. Coral glow, yeah. No, some people are still disputing it, so it's not the same thing and blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's going to happen with these as well because I, I've I've probably got 30 whites and they all look different depending on what you've got in them. You get your four gene whites, you get your um, whites with, that have anery in them, you get your whites which have hyper in them. Um, they all look different. Um, and the, naturally, I go for the snow whites because that they are the most popular and they have not one mark on them. And then you get into your moon glow type animals, the three, four, five gene stuff, which are all pure white, um, pink tongue and, and red eyes the same way again. So what I tried to do after that was... I thought I want to produce a white that has no hypo or super hypo or white northern, whatever you like to call it in it. And then I produced the pearl, which has got no white in it, but it's a pure white animal with very fine um, yellow banding. It has no hypo in it. So it was produced by putting a golden snow over a, a three gene platinum. And it has no hypo in it. Yet it's almost pure white. Yeah, it you has, can see there's some patterning, but yeah. Yeah, it's... there's a really fine um, yellow barring on it. So there is a way. So this animal or this line, uh, which I was only, I, I spent four years working on it, and this year will be the first year that the progeny, including this visual, can be used to take the neck to the next step because I abandoned a lot of the four gene morphs when I saw how everything was turning white. And I think the American people have the same sort of problem with um, their leucistic ball pythons. Everyone hates whites, or a lot of people hate whites over there, whereas here the, white, the pure... Um, Patternless whites are, are the most popular popular animal here. Um, well, that comes in stages here, I think. Um, there was a point where the white snake was this unbelievable idea. It was the holy grail to get, and a lot of people did care, but eventually we just kind of started going in other directions, and we realized it was more of a dead end because you had limitations when you had a white snake. That's where I am at because, if, because it's co-dominant, it – even um, some of the, like even the Calypso, it was bright, sort of a bright orangey banded uh, animal. And as it's getting, as it got older, I've got some that are like five years old, they're almost like they're the faintest uh, cream. The, the white takes over everything. Um, the platinums go from a silver to chrome color right through to almost white depending on the levels of of super hypo they have in them so i abandoned the four gene um midstream when i saw others had were producing four gene or possible three and four gene animals which were all white i can get a pure white animal from a sun glow I can get a pure white animal with red eyes from a Calypso. I can get a pure white animal with red eyes um, from a moon glow. 
and and it just continues on so why spend 5 10 15 years developing a 5g in animal which is going to be white so i said i haven't got that much time left so um i'm not going to go down that road i've got to create a white that will give you the four genes but it's not codominant and that's where the oreo project came in that's where the pearl project has come in um and where the caramel ice projects come in so um whether you know i fizzle out before those projects are done i don't know I've, uh, like i said i turned 63 yesterday but i feel like i'm 30. um you know it's up to the natural forces to see how long i'm going to survive but i have so many projects currently running which are taking it away from having white the white super hypo in it because I don't want to produce five gen animals that are white. Yeah. Um, well, I always make a joke that um, it takes as long to make a nice animal as it does to make a bad looking animal. Um, you kind of have to get there and see what you end up with. So, you know, I do understand like what you're saying, they're going the long way to do something they could do simpler, but you know, there's still the challenge of maybe that random thing happened along the way, genes interact in a way you wouldn't expect, that you kind of have to go. And then once you get there, it's the wrong direction, dial it back a little bit. Mm. So having seen the guys that raced forward, um, it was beneficial to me because I didn't want to invest all that space and time to produce a white animal, which I already had. Um, because the market is is savage they'll say that's just a white animal why are you charging me 10 grand for this when i can buy you know a single gene for 1500 so they'll savage you they a lot of people don't care about the genetics that are in it um so that that was one area um and i'll abandon projects where i don't get really um vibrant and vigorous animals there's no point having a bright red animal that you know you have to prop up and hand feed and and carry around to, to keep it to survive there's no there's no benefit to that and there were some morphs that i produced that were like that i just abandoned the project i thought no we've got to go a different direction because yeah, it, there's nothing worse than a customer coming to you say look i've just spent my hard-earned savings um I, I spent three years saving up for this and it's dropped dead on me the next day it's just not it's just not good for the industry yeah um oh i was gonna say oh, that coming. is good that you're going towards healthier animals versus trying to jump ahead um i was curious uh on your artificial insemination process, did you start that with a company? Well, originally I did it because I'm a chemist by trade um, and I've got fairly good schooling in processes. But the problem is, is that in Australia, I don't know if it's like this in America, um, any type of insemination and that is frowned on by the authorities for what reason i don't know i think they might think you're going to produce you know some frankenstein or something i don't know um my point of the insemination was to use it for females that are just psychotic um and like with humans there's there's psychotic women and men in the animals is the same they're psychotic females that will never breed as long as you live because they they either have had a a bad run with a male previously and that's usually the case or their window is so small like i've got what you call t positive i don't i still don't classify them as t positive i, I still call them a, a, a normal hypo um she has a window of three days and if you don't catch that three day window she will savage the male um she does have a window and um now i know what the, the the keys are to her when she is ready to accept a male um 
I wanted the insemination for that so that they don't even know that um, that they've been basically mated. And I did several, several inseminations, which were successful. Didn't have any more babies than a normal mating would have. Um, but someone quietly contacted me and said, look, they may frown on this. I got onto CITES, they said, because the other thing I wanted to do was be able to say to you, they send you sperm, right, of, of a morph. Mm -hmm. And CITES said no body part, whether it's shed, sperm, toenail, anything can be um, sent overseas once they're on CITES. So that, that basically... Um, put a stop to that because that was my whole purpose of it is to be able to say, okay, I'm not allowed to give you my male hypermelanistic or my male calypso. Here's a sample of sperm for you to inseminate the female with, but they won't allow that either. And even our licensing system won't allow. It. Yeah, can I give it something? Um, it's something that was brought up in a conversation a long time ago. I think Cheryl brought it up where it might have been with um, horse sperm or something like that, a non cites I'm sure, um, where I believe that was like the imported export of sperm from other countries and you guys aren't bringing animals in. Um, so that was kind of always one of those things where, you know, I think it was curious if it could be a loophole. You know, it's really cool that you move forward with it. I got a bunch of questions too about the process, so even though we can't do it here. Um, are you ultrasounding your females to know when their window is before you do that or are you just planning that based on your cooling? No, so... I saw your previous podcast and I've followed you for many years, Dave, and um, you mentioned that people had tried the ultrasounding and same I had. And then you had Luke on previously, Alex, who we've got a very good vet company here in Australia that started CD scanning them. Um, and if you go onto my Instagram, you'll see a lot of the images of scanned animals and it's 3d you can see inside them you can see everything but it's cost prohibit prohibitive prohibitive and um because Luke, luke's got a good relationship with the guy he he's never done gravid females but he he did do one so you could see the whole bone structure see if there was anything wrong with their bones um so i've never done it. what where I see their window is I do um, the, the whole tail scratching thing. So just where their back legs are with with your forefinger or whichever finger you like, um, you just do a gentle rub and she'll lift her tail up straight away when she's ready to take a male. If she's not, you know, be careful of your finger because she'll, she'll swing around and rip it off. Um, so that's how I see when my girls are ready. Um, that may not mean that their follicles are the right size, but she's willing to accept a male. So there's so much work that really still needs to be done to, because they produce their follicles in the summertime. And um, that's why you need to have the females up to, um, up to weight so that they're producing the follicles as well. And it's only through sheer luck sometimes that they'll produce a litter the next season it is because they don't have time to produce a new batch of follicles for, for that coming season. If mine have 15 to 19 babies, I won't even attempt to breed them the following season because I know they won't have had time to produce follicles. If they have a really small litter where they've had a fair few slugs or you know, three or five babies, I know she'll go again the following season because she's had time to reproduce more follicles. Now, that's only something that I've watched. It's not scientifically documented. I could be completely wrong, but it's from what I've seen and the way they behave. Um, so yeah, if there was a process where you could um, do it, because it, the people say about their scales, it's not about the scales so much, but there's an underlying layer underneath the scales, which is air and something else. 
which prevents the ultrasounding to give you a good image. And sometimes you think they're follicles, but they're not. They're just air pockets. So, um, again, if it was a million-dollar animal, you probably would go through the, the whole process. But there's no one I know here that's that's doing ultrasounding of the blue tongues. Okay. And you also said that even with um, artificial insemination, you're still at around that 60% success rate. Now, prior to you using that sperm that you pulled, are you guys testing and see it's viable, seeing you said some of these are dubs? Well, originally I, I didn't, but we only sort of came across that idea last season because there's a, a group of us that are working on it. And um, so, yeah, that, that will be the way we go in the future. The, the, like you said, the, the sperm may not have been viable. And just because they come out of the brumation and the males are pacing their cages, that doesn't mean, uh, well, we've, these scientists have proven, it doesn't mean that they're actually, they're, they call it meiosis or mitosis. It's a stage where the sperm is inactive through brumation. The advent of temperature increase causes that process to start. That's like a, a bird sitting on eggs. Once they start incubating the eggs, they start to develop. And then it gets to a point where they say it's between the beginning of August to the end of September where he's viable. His sperm is ready to go. But to pick up that exact day, you, you have, you'll you have to um, view them under a microscope. And that's what we intend to do. So if we've put, say, a platinum male onto a pearl or whatever and successful mating, because I've had them like you would have, both of you would have that I call it squirting, which is probably not the right term, but the male will mate with them. They'll walk around a little bit. Then she'll lift her tail up and squirt out the excess. I always used to think, oh, bloody hell, she's, she's um, squirted it all out. But I always believed now to be just excess that she doesn't want in there. And we, we, um, with the um, aid of a, microscopic slide a colleague of mine tested it and said there's wrigglers everywhere so and she fell grab it so all these little processes i intend to adopt and see if that makes um, it any better but like the scientists have said the ones that they've studied in the wild not all the males are fertile at the time when they are uh, mentally ready to to um, mate with the females so it's it's one of those things i think we've got a long way to go um and they're not mammals Ma mammals can s produce new sperm all the time where their theories are now is they produce the amount of sperm they're going to use at the beginning of the brumation period and it just sits there in storage and i agree with it to a degree but why oh, and you know why is it that um some only have that tiny little amount and some have yeah you know, more volume well it could be just the the way that that particular morph is designed like usually the ones that have the like my four gene platinum, he can only do two girls. He'll he'll do fifteen girls, but only two will fall gravid every year for five years now. Two girls, so I always have to pick the best girl that I want to produce. Um, I've got a, um, a a four gene white male. He's the same, and I always thought it was the shedding. So everyone is under the agreement, oh, unless they've shed, um, they won't produce viable sperm, which is not correct either. These particular males that have the very, very low um, fertility, they never shed. They'll shed in the end of October when all my girls are finished. So, But they, yet they still produce litters, but not, all, not big litters. So we go down one path. And it leads us to a dead end. We go down another path that leads us to a dead end. So for me, it's interesting. It's 
it's an interest side of things and the best litters you'll get is from head to head yeah but people don't want that anymore i don't i very very rarely put visual to visual because they're not as strong as a head to a visual um so where i can i'll use a four gene head onto a four gene visual or you know whatever you're trying to produce so the biggest Oh, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'll be honest. I'm going to do this every once in a while because I get like a thousand questions that everything you're saying because everything you're saying is very fascinating. I always want to hear a little more about it. Um, so when you were discussing how you believe there could be a correlation to temperature and sex determination in your babies, mm -hmm. um, then we're also talking about how certain males can only go so far. Maybe they can only make it to females. Do you think possibly certain regions where these animals are collected where there's a higher percentage of females maybe genetically or you know evolution these males actually carry more sperm because of that population fluctuation where it's less males to females and then maybe certain males pulled from region where there's more females there's actually less sperm again through evolution yeah it could be a case but i can't i can't comment on wild population because mine are all artificially produced basically they're all morphs I don't have any pure locale animals anymore. So, you know, it's sort of a bit like, you know, um, the, the, the pet industry in general. They, they are going to vary a lot from, but see that the males that are very low in sperm volume, let's call it, are all anery based. Like the golden snow male is anery onto albino. The platinum is a four gene platinum. Now, normal platinums, you know, the 35, 40 centimetre long. He's about 15 centimetres long. You know, he does, the anery reduces their, their size. A and also, in a lot of cases, their um, vigo as well. So, in order to make a snow, you had to use the anery gene. In order to make some of the other genetics um you had to use anneries but i try to avoid anery as much as i can because of the f like fertility and vigor aspect of it there are a few anneries i've now over the years produced that i've put through massive marebas which get up to 50 60 centimeters long and they're a locale animal and the anneries are a lot bigger and a little bit more vigorous. But um, the general Kimberley type that was originally found, they're very small and not very vigorous. So that goes through into their genetics then. And then, you know, people sort of they shy away from snows and things because they're not as, you know, as uh, vigorous as others. So all the snows like the white snows now that are brilliant white with the uh the strawberry banding through them they're all from the platinum line um so they've got the vigor in them interesting do you want to go with this alex um so i was curious you mentioned you guys recorded like hemipene size do you yeah, guys the did they they, they they used wild populations to um, not hemipene the testicle size. So they measured them. And I think I sent you the, I don't know if I sent you the link or not, Alex. You can read the whole paper on it um, where they actually give you the millimetre length at different times of the season and when they found that the males were mating and when they were no longer mating. So it's as not like mammals which produce new sperm every sea, like every day or every second day. These, um, this mitosis or meiosis process only initiates once they've gone through brumation and the temperatures start to increase. Then once the temperatures go too high, then they start to shrivel up again and not produce and or not have anything or not, be have viable sperm anymore so when i see people heating them up to 35 40 degrees a you're cutting down the um the the period where they're active 
and I believe you're also eventually destroying the sperm because it gets too hot. Oh, so you haven't checked yourself then if like the size of that will I make can't it. like you'd have to I don't know how they do it, whether they operate on the animal they operated on the animals but everything they said in the paper equated to when my males were waking up when they were most vigorous and when they were starting to slow down and then eventually stop so their natural um, documented, testicle size of the blue tongues equated to when I was, you know, just through my own trials and errors, pulling them out of brumation and um, when they were stopping. So it made sense to me and that then it gave me a reason why they're doing it. Like you'll see your blue tongues racing up and down the cage. That doesn't mean they're ready to mate. It means that they've woken up which is generally in the wild here about two weeks before the females and they then go like a colleague of mine has one living in his yard a male it's under a tin sheet we'll get down to two degrees in the winter time and he sometimes lifts the sheet up and it's curled up under there he says as soon as the spring starts and uh, september he'll lift a sheet up there's shed under there and he's gone so he's out searching for females now once the winter starts to come or when it starts getting cold again he's back under there and he's been there for a number of years i believe so the males come out because the females what what we've found and what the studies we did was the females own the territories in the wild they'll live in a suburban backyard most of the time and they only have a limited f food source so the males will travel. So all the road kills here in Australia that you see, you know, you see them squashed on the road. You, you look at them, they're 99% males because they're, they're following their nose or their tongue and looking for girls. And you'll see them in the summer, you know, just in the springtime, you see them squashed on the road. Females are very sedentary. They've got their habitat. They need a constant food source so that they can, um, you know, um, have enough weight and enough food resources for for litters to to and i've got a female living here in the yard um she's very smart and people say i love monitors and all that because they're so smart you wouldn't believe how smart blue tongues are um in my shed i have a stack of paint you know paint sheets that you use drop sheets we call them are they paint sheets in america you call them right you put well, them maybe you put them on the floor when you're painting walls so that the splatter goes on the sheet rather than they're a cloth you know like yeah drop cloth drop yeah. cloth so i've got them stacked in four i think there were four or five high um styrofoam boxes about the size of um we call them broccoli boxes and one day i was in there in the middle of winter and i was going through the shed and i saw this big scratched out hole on the fourth one up I thought, oh, shit, I've got rats, right? So uh, tentatively I took the first two off and then I slowly cleared the drop sheet and in the middle of it was a female brumating blue tongue. So it takes a, a next level of thought to, to go up there, scratch through the side of the container, make a hole and go in there. So she's found that that shed during the day was probably getting up to 25 degrees because uh, it was only a small garden shed made of color bond tin and then um she brumated in there in the winter time so she was there all the time then when spring came she was she was uh running around you'd see her in the yard from here there and then end of january she'd be dropping litters so the males were coming to her and i'd find the males in the yard so when you see your males running around in your cages, doesn't mean that they're, they've got viable sperm yet. They're ready to go out and take on any opposition and fight with other males because that's what the males do for the two, first two weeks. And then after the two weeks, generally it's about two weeks, depending on weather, then the females start to come out because the males have asserted their, their dominance. They know who's, who's kingpin and the girls are ready to to accept the males 
So when I see mine running around, I say, okay, they're out of brumation. Now I'm going to wait for them to, to shed. And then there's some like the ones I've mentioned. You're waiting, waiting, waiting. They've been out for a month, no shed. And I think, you know, am I going to miss the window? Am I not going to miss the window? And some won't be active. Uh, they'll be running around, but they won't want, you know, you can put a thermal right next to them. You'll just look at it and fall asleep until he sheds and all of a sudden it's i always say to my colleagues it's like switching on a light they suddenly become the next day or two days later they just become super active and want to mate everything you know even a piece of rope that you throw in there type of thing so there's so much to learn and yeah we we do our best and um i want majority females so that's where the temperature thing comes in um have you um, or any breeders there ever tried staggering their males out in cooling bringing some out and um bringing a little more out later if that yeah. makes sense yeah we've all done that um but the problem is is that um if you, you could miss the female's window so that's what i did with these males that weren't shedding so every couple of days i'd go or once a week i'd scratch a tail once she lifted up, I knew she was still in season, beauty. And then, you know, you'd get to a point where you did and she did, and i think, oh, shit. So I'd put him in with her, and if he was active, he'd try and she'd bite and, and fight him. So, um, we, yeah, we, stay, we try and stagger them, but because they've got so much different genetics in them, a lot of them stagger themselves. Like, I'll have males coming out or ready to mate you know, with a three-week type window, some of straight away beginning of August or end of July, and some won't be ready until the end of August. So they yeah. seem to sort of um, stagger themselves to a degree. Yeah, I've kind of wondered that here with some of the collections because, um, you know, of course, I feel like sometimes this part of my room is going really early. This part of my room wants to go maybe about a week or two later. And like you said, some of these males have in a very small window, you miss your windows. Um, and, you know, I find here we really do commit to our parents, similar to you guys, based on genetics, where, you know, we kind of come into the season with a plan. And then either, again, our male not showing interest. Um, you know, when you talk shed cycles, you know, I try to wait for my females to shed first because I find when my males grab them, they slide off them a lot easier. They're peeling off that shed. They get discouraged over time and then they just give up on it um but you know i think everybody's still just trying to figure out the trick to maybe get above that 60 percent. so you know what is it going to take yeah when i when i talk about shed cycles i mean the males i have females um that'll shed prior to going into brumation and won't shed until a month or so after they've dropped the babies so when when i'm talking about shed cycles i only sort of concentrate on males the females um to me is irrelevant when they shed it's never been uh to me it's never been an issue now yeah, when to, when to, you do the artificial insemination uh so say i took uh got some uh sperm from a male hmm. in a syringe and i just more or less shoot it in the female if that batch is viable in theory there is a chance that it could work yeah because uh, like the sperm that's been tested you know you've taken it from the female it might be three minutes for you to walk over to the microscope and then test it and it's still viable so again i haven't tested viability of sperm it could be yeah, you know, in a refrigerated system, it could be weeks that you can store it for or whatever. Um, we haven't gone into that detail. Yeah, because I was able to more or less suck some up on a male that would consistently miss. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to squirt it into a female just to see what would happen more or less. But then I was able to get a lock on that female, so I don't know if it yeah, will so be. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know which one it will end up as, but. And that's the thing, um, because of the volume I have, it, it's 
you can't you can't spend every waking hour on certain things. You just have to isolate an animal or two, and you know then you get a phone call. I want you know thirty hypers, and you know you think oh shit, I'm gonna change my plan again. I've got to produce these. So what took me a lot of time too, and this might be an interest for some of your readers and, and listeners, is there was no point producing one and two animals for the market. So, you know, running down a channel of, of a morph, say you want to produce a snow and you, and you can only produce three or four babies because 30, 40 people want that, want that morph. So I thought this is going to take a long time. This is going to benefit me in the long run but it'll put me behind in certain aspects of breeding. So what I made sure is that every single animal that I breed has every gene in it, and that takes time. So when we talk about, you know, white northerns, super hypos, uh, hypermelanistics, albinos, I don't go to produce them. They're offshoots of what I'm aiming for. So... Um, and what I mean by that is say I'm going for a Calypso and I produce five hypers in that litter, they're excess to my needs basically. So they get sold as you know, multi-gene hypers. Um, so albinos, hypers. Albinos now, when they first started off, we could get easily $1,500 a baby. Now you push to get you know, six, seven hundred for a, a single gene albino, you're getting 1500 for two, three, and four gene albinos. So, as time, which has lasted a long time, you've got to remember they came into the industry about 2004, 2005. Oh, sorry, about 2004, 2005. And we've been getting $1,500 a baby since then. And now, you know, finally, the, the market's been so saturated that because um, we're producing, what, 70, 80 a year and there's multiple breeders producing the same. So the market for albinos is so saturated, you can't even sell them as a pet pretty much now. Um, hypermelanistics are still the most... Um, are still the most sought-after morph and you can sell a hundred of them every year without even blinking, you know. Like even Luke said, the minute he puts them up for sale, they're gone. So over there, um, you know, what's the etiquette or rule of thumb when, you know, you talked about like the price of albinos stays very stable for a long time because it doesn't seem like it was super high to start. Seeing it was kind of affordable for most. Um, has there been any of the newer mutations that have come out that like, the breeder has put some crazy price tag on, like way above what we've ever asked before to see if somebody's willing to pay it? Not really, because we pretty much understand our market here. Um, 10000 10, is about the ceiling here. Um, when I first produced the Platinums, I was getting 8000 a baby, because it was in such a limited demand and it was a stepping stone. Now they go for about 3000 um, But you're looking at, I produced my first Platinum 2011. So, you know, we've, we've been selling them for, what, 20 years and getting that sort of money for them. Um, like with the Pides now, people are starting to sell some of them for for eight, 10 K. Um, but that's not going to last because our market's very small. Um, because all the people that buy them, they, they want, it's an investment for a lot of them and they want to make their money back. So what, what's going to happen is, um, and no one knows the genetics of them yet, whether or not that back stripe is going to, uh, color up in any morphs that you put through is other morphs going to look great with it in it or are they going to be better off just reproducing the wild type as as a pet and yeah all that's happening but it was only found in 2020 um and um they only produced hets from the original pairing and he's got very low fertility as well. 
Um, so it had to be outcrossed. Um, and this year, I think it's the first year that they're hitting the market. So it's going to be, for me, I look at it, a lot of the, the new morphs as, you know, a white palette and I'm going to add the colours to it and make it something. At the moment, when it's not in shed and that, it's very washed out. So if you look at that, that's the founder animal there, one off. So everything um, that's produced from that or has been produced from that is a single genetic line. So it's got to be outcrossed. It's There's a lot of work that has to be done with it. And no one really knows, you know, will that pink coloration. So when, when this animal um, suns itself and gets up to about 30 degrees, it goes bright pink um, with the back stripe staying a brownie colour. And... Um, no one knows yet genetically whether that's going to be imparted onto some of the other genes. Like with, with the ball pythons and pythons in general, when they made the dream sickle, it was the most beautiful animal that, that most people could envisage. But they've added to it now. They've put other genes into it to make it more orange and even better. We don't know if this animal is going to impart that pattern and just replace say an albinistic pattern onto that back stripe or a hyper would make a black back stripe uh, and it won't be long and, and that will be determined but at the moment um you know if you're investing in that project then always have a plan b um you know again similar to like what you're saying and you know there's a lot of really good ball comparisons here um you know, the pie ball python, the same thing, you know, um, Ralph Davis came out with the lesser ball python um, bred into the pied, ended up making an all-white snake with beady eyes, and the head scales were a little different size. Mm -hmm. um, we then learned that certain other genes, when put into pied, you don't get the reaction you think you would get. So I'm sure there's going to be a trial and error, and honestly, I think the melanistic one is one I'm really looking forward to see because, you know, all that color underneath those melanistic scales that, again, comes out in your albino, I'd be curious what it does with that white, if it can change it at all. Um, but, you know, there are limitations sometimes with pie projects, and I'm sure some, some things won't work out how you plan, but, you know, I'm sure you guys are going to make some phenomenal animals. And I think Alex told me that um, there's another trait over there, and you got to tell me it again, that was allelic with the white-sided or pie gene that you guys have. Did you yeah, say? the patchwork or... Well, the patchwork, as I understand it, because it's never been formally described or presented what's in it, I think it's what they're calling the T positive onto an albino and a hypo, a hypo, so, so or a white northern. Um, and if you look at a lot of the whites on the market, they have pink tongues. I've got them. I've put them up on my page. I've got. Um, white head platinums that have got pure pink tongues. So um, whether they're allelic or not is yet to be determined or whether the original hats were put over and then bred back and produced a percentage of patchwork pies. I don't know because no one's telling anybody anything. So what my biggest concern with the uh, melanistic is I produced a rainbow melanistic when it was young, it was um, every colour on the rainbow. And because of the co-dominant factor of the hypermelanistics, by the time it was six months old, it was jet black. You could see the colour every shed, the colour infusing over. And if you look on my um, Instagram, you'll see I've produced copper hypers. But as soon as they get to about six or eight months old, they become jet black. So the problem with the pied, which I could be completely wrong on, this is only my opinion or my thoughts, is hopefully it doesn't do the same and you just get a pure black animal. Because I noticed one of the breeders, um, he's produced some um, with, with the patchwork thing and there's pure white ones in it. So that that sort of sent a few alarm bells ringing. 
And that's why I'm trying to produce lines that don't have the white northern or the super hypo in them because like the oreo line is a, a white animal with brown banding which was found like that in the wild so i'm hoping it's not co-dominant so when i put a white over it i know it's not a lulic because it produced just hats um so hopefully it's another avenue or another pathway to produce you know what i originally wanted to produce which was the panda or the orca i used to call it an orca but it became a platinum and that so it, there is the she, oreo, she right? dropped, yep she dropped 10 babies and um they're ready to breed this season so you mentioned before that you are getting 10 ovulations out of single males, um, give or take on your good males. Um, are you doing multiple breedings per day per male or how are you spacing out your breeding? Well, before um, I engaged in that article about the, uh, the quantitative amount of sperm that each male produces, um, I'd give him a, I'd give them a shot and then if I got around to it, I might give him another shot a couple of weeks later with the same femur. Then when I was researching and found that that article about the quantitative amounts of sperm, I said, stuff this because I'm going to waste all the sperm on one girl and he's just enjoying himself. So what I did was I started only doing one if they had a good lock, if you missed naturally and sort of went up the side of her or something, different story. But um, I was doing one pairing per female with the male, sometimes two two day spacing, sometimes three day spacing, sometimes it'd be a week. It depended on my workload as far as matings was concerned. And I didn't want the gap to be any greater than three or four days because then I thought, well, are they going to drop babies at different times? Because in the past I have had litters produced where they'll drop half the litter one day and then four or five days later they drop the other half of the litter. And I was always wondering, was that because they were mated at different times and they started to develop straight away or is it just because, you know, they, they developed differently at different times so when i did the one mating per female i had the same percentage results as multiple matings so except i was able to instead of using just doing two or three females yeah they were getting five six eight ten females okay. so when, when people do them multiple times i and i was in the same boat I think, oh, well, if um, she wasn't ready, she might have been ready on the second mating. If she wasn't ready on the second mating, she might have been ready on the third. It's sort of like you're know, rolling three dices instead of one. Um, it's just an insecurity thing on my part to, to see whether or not... Because I, I've seen them in the wild and um, I've been up north and I've seen five males hanging off one northern female. Um at the same time, I've seen um, females get mated and then I've never seen that male in my yard again. Um, so I don't think the males hang around. If they pick up a scent of another female somewhere else, they're off. I don't think the same male, and it's only my opinion, all right? I've got no factual proof except what I saw that they would mate the same females again because she'll take off she'll go somewhere else the only thing is because i i bred westerns for a long time and um i had like 10 or 12 pairs of them and the most unique thing with the westerns is because they live in such an arid climate and such a inhospitable climate for animals um, the males actually latch on to the females and they'll stay attached. And the longest I ever had was 11 hours. 
he would not let go of her. And in that 11 hours, he made it to five times. And that was it. He was done. I put him onto another female who wouldn't have a bar of her. So in circumstances like that, I think that um, because they probably don't come across very many females in those arid conditions, they'll latch onto that female and they'll do all their matings that same day. So when you're saying what's the spacing in that species, um, there is no spacing. He's mating uh, up to five times in that day and then he lets go and he's gone. Okay. Um, well, honestly, I will say that, um, you know, what you're saying about putting one male or one male to the one female and not necessarily worrying about the second lock, um, you know, I think that's really beneficial. Um, you know, I've had this debate with people a lot of times because I don't have enough males. I do try to get multiple females out of a male. But then, you know, there are some people in the hobby that will do one female four days in a row with the same male. Um, you know, I first got started, I started with one male in my first lock and I try to finish her off with a second male just in case and i'll be honest i feel like it's been a lot of different tries for different things over the years it's comforting to hear you say this because honestly i really always am in a position where i gotta stretch my males out and it's nice to know that that one lock is more important than five or six locks or three or four like some people do and that's why the reason why we want to test the sperm each time is then you've got certainty or you've got a guarantee that on the male side the sperm was viable when he mated that femur because even if we do one lock now and she doesn't work you can't blame it on the one lock you can only blame it was his sperm viable at the time that he mated that one girl and i've got data you know as long as my arm on all the matings i've done because i keep i'm a bit of a a hoarder with data i everything i even put the temperatures that they made it at um you know what time of the day they made it and um that all collates into a pretty good picture of of what i think is is that particular male now i can't randomize it for all the males that's why i have a log a log register or a log book for each individual male for every year um, so that I know, okay, this platinum male and he's got his code number, he bred on the 14th of January, uh, 14th of August, yeah, he did four girls and I put what he produced, which day the locks were, what temperature the locks were, was it a good mating, did she squirt, did she not squirt, and I've got a complete history of every male I have. And the problem is sometimes by the time you've proven males out, uh, they're a bit like me. As you get older, you know, you're less less agile and less willing to, to mate. And uh, older males tend, people say they get lazy. I don't think they get lazy. That They just, you know, get old. Simple as that. The best males are usually two, three-year-old males. They'll, they'll mate like crazy and then it's a, a steady decline after they get a lot older but there are males like that will still be going um like they claim the one that went over that melanistic female was 22 years old so i can't prove or disprove that but um or what i've seen in my collection is as they get to about five or six years old they have a cognitive d decline in in their sexual appetite Okay. Um, the best ones are the young ones. So why do you think the females squirt? Because I've noticed a lot, Will. Yeah, I know. And I always used to say, okay, they squirted because, you know, that's ex excess and that's a successful mating. But when I started playing around with the um, artificial insemination, they were getting a full load in there and they weren't squirting. So sometimes I think, is it just an um sort of reaction like they've got the shits that they've got made it type of thing because they're really most of the time they're not really that willing a, a combatant with the male they, they just let him basically rape her and um they they will fight back if they're not ready but the squirting i thought oh, it might be just the liquid that transports the the sperm to the female and, but then when we did the 
the testing with with the sperm that eject or like the ejected um, sperm as well. Yeah, I think. So, Brent, oh, I was going to say, Rick Ergy back in the day would talk about holding his females up afterwards to stop them from pushing that out because he had noticed that was happening a lot. Um, but yeah, I yeah, did that for, yeah, I did that for a while, Dave, as well. I, as soon as he's made it, I grab her and then you know hold the tail to, down and walk her to the other room where her cage was but they'd still some didn't but some still as soon as they got onto their they into their cage up go the tail and they'd squirt it so okay there is like i said there's there's a million ways to do the same thing and still have a good outcome just finding what works for you but like i said there's always been a million tips in the industry again multiple locks with one male and a female um, again, holding her up to make sure she can't kick the sperm out. I'm sure there's a lot of arguments on different temperatures we use here. Um, but in the end, we all seem to keep on making 60% of our collection go every year. Yeah, and, and that's that's the thing. The more data I've got, the more confused I'm getting. Um, because every time, like I say, you go down this one road and you think, yeah, I'm there. Um, I think this is <laughs> this is the the key. And it's then you get this these varying degrees of uh, success and you think oh god i'm back to square one but for me it's an interesting just producing sausage machine animals doesn't interest me it never has never will i try to produce something that is visually appealing and um sort of takes the blue tongue industry to a next level because let's face it when i started all you could find was um pretty drab looking wild types um now look at some like the rainbows that are that uh, were produced from my line they're bright orange with blue legs you know um you, you've got uh, things that are bright pure white you've got um animals that are, are multicolored and like when i produced the pure purple um you know the uh, purple passion lavas like when they were born, I thought, my God, like, hopefully they keep this. So for the last five years, I've been working on ways to try and keep that colour. But they lose a degree of it to adulthood. Um, then I produced, or my line produced the rainbow lavas, and they've kept their colour. They're bright orange with the blue legs, even into adulthood, because they're three years old now. Um, other ones, um, and always the real purple animals have got hypo or super hypo or white, not whatever you like to call it in them. But the problem with it, you've got to fix it somehow. So the only way I could ever fix it was my golden snow female, which is het hyper, she's kept the purple. So whether it's the hyper in her that's, in the het phase that's keeping the purple i don't know it's um but she's kept it so i've used her and i put her over animals and they've produced purple babies but they're only they were only born this year so it'll be interesting to see if they hold it as well but generally you know when you see the birth photos of these bright purple babies they usually got high hypo in them or white and um it declines as they age and becomes white. So all these bright purple, nice looking albinos, most of them end up with white sp spotting or white banding in them. And they're the things that interest me, finding out what does each gene contribute to that animal. I can be a sausage machine, produce 50,000 of one thing and, you know, go, home, go inside and feel deflated that I've wasted my day. For me, it's inter the interest is in producing something new and understanding why you've produced it and how you can recreate that rather than it just being a hit and miss. So for the last 20, 30 years, that's what I've what, what's always been my interest, whether it was in the fish or whether it was in the reptiles or the orchids. Um, I always had an interest to understand the genetics. Well, I think that's really cool, and honestly, you're really fortunate to be in the field you are for your career that you can 
use that for the hobby too. Um, you know, it's kind of a blessing to be able to do both because, you know, I'm sure a lot of us would enjoy to have the background you do. Yeah. And I, and I, I, I'm not an authority in anything, as I always say, because I'm speculating, I'm testing things out. And then the following year does the complete opposite. Um, I try to provide my animals with the best care, the best food. They get, you know, vet formulated food. Um, they are in immaculate housing, probably better than how I live sometimes. Um, I have the latest building that we built. It's got um, extractor fans, which do complete change overs of the whole room every five hours so that you don't have any smell or anything in there um so you know all that sort of stuff and then you know i sent alex um a thing on caging which i was so upset about because let's t use the the term experts which you know people mock you for and say it's a drip under pressure but we've we've had 20 30 years worth of experience they never consulted any of us before they enforced the cage sizing requirements so some university graduate decided upon himself that this is the minimum cage size required for a blue tongue of this size yeah you know, this diameter and they have no understanding of the natural conditions of that animal so what they do is if you have a male and he travels half a kilometre to a female, you can't have half a kilometre cage. The rest of the year he's lying under his, under his hide. He doesn't even want to come out. He's not interested in anything. So four months, five months of the year, um, if you had, say, an elaborate pit system, you never see your animal. It's asleep. It comes out for three months, four months of the year, and the rest of the time it's asleep. They come out when they're hungry and when they're thirsty or they're looking for a female. It's the only time you'll see them. So why have this a massive, what, what was one woman said, oh, you've got to have 12 square metres minimum cage um, floor space. Well, what rot? Because all they do is they run to the edge of the cage and try to climb up and out. Then they say 60, 60 uh, centimetre height, which is what, two foot in, in feet? Yeah. I try to minimise it as much as I can. So mine are 30 centimetres high. Because if they're climbing up the side, they'll do their backs in. With the lower cages, they don't. And if you have a, um, a cage that's 60 centimetre high, you have to put an attachment into the cage if you're using UVB because uh, over 15 centimetres, UVB doesn't work off those globes. So, you know, they, they bring in, they bring in a, a system with no understanding of the animal. Um, and, you, and you have to go by, but otherwise if they come and inspect you, you get fined. So we have, again, these exact same conversations here uh, with ball python keeping, some of them, um, so we feel the rack systems are too small. Um, but I feel with some of these, I feel like they project how they think they would feel in that cage, and they put that into consideration when they say what the requirements should be, and less about what the actual animal needs based on what it does in the wild. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah, they can, can climb. I've seen blue tongue scale fences, um, but they don't choose to do that unless they're after something. Yeah, uh, you might have saw that Ron St. Pierre post where he made that joke for one of his um, blue tongues was really high in the enclosure yeah. masking on a branch. Yeah. One of mine got out. Well, they get out quite regularly because I, I'm getting a bit absent-minded, but um, they get out. I, I leave the cage unlocked or something, and... Um, you know, the, the, what are they, V18 racks, they're, they're, they're about six, seven foot high. And I found, found it right on the top, top level of that. So they can climb quite, quite skillfully, but just look at the, the morphology of the animal. It's, it's not built for climbing. They'll climb if they have to get over um, a rocky, um, hillside or they'll climb if they need to go somewhere but they choose to be on the ground I've seen them running through the yard they'll run as quick as they can from point A to point B because we've got kookaburras, we've got 
the brown snakes, they all predate on them. And the longer they're out for, the quicker that they get predated. So you see them running along the fence line. You don't see them, you know, casually walking across the lawn and laying there sunning themselves. You never see them like that. If you came to, to Wilton where I live, you would think that there was not one blue tongue living there because they don't come out to make themselves a victim of predation. They run, they hide, they stick their heads out the minute you go out. And I've seen this by putting them in outdoor enclosures and indoor. Their whole mindset changes. And this is where I say they're very smart animals. You put them in an outdoor enclosure and even because we live near an airport, you see the planes go over, they straight away duck inside. They're scared because they think it's a bird. Um, when they're inside, that same animal that you had outside will just lays out in the open uh, under his light or on the edge of the three-foot cage and um, as though there's not a care in the world because he's got the ceiling of the shed or the, the facility over him or her. So they they know when they're in harm's way and they know when they're you know, safe. And there, there's a special term for it. I can't think of it, but a lot of people put human emotions and human um, wants and needs onto their animals. And that, that's anthropomorphizing. Yeah, something anthropomorphism or something like that is. And that's the biggest harm we can do to an animal. It's like, you know, expecting a dog to go to school or sit at the table and eat with a knife and fork. That is ridiculous. And that's what they're expecting. I always say to people, it's like you, someone asking you to, to put your bed out in the middle of the Sydney cricket ground and sleep in the middle of the night out in the open. Like, who wants that? My babies, and I assimilated this from wild babies, like I had a couple of litters dropped in my yard. And what happens is initially they were under the tin where the female dropped them all together. There was 11 of them, all normal heads, you know, or normal wild type and i had a series of blocks going it's about 175 meters is the length of my my block and um these stones were spaced about a foot apart going along the fence line over the course of three weeks that group of babies started to disperse i'd find three under one rock two under another rock and after the third week a lot of them were gone and the only ones I found were single animals so what I do is I use that with the babies into my culturing system they were never out in the open looking around they go under the rocks because the rocks usually harbor snails which they they feed on here in Australia and um, they love snails. That's that's their gourmet food for them. And um, I use the, the lowest, like the V18 tubs, for the first three months of their lives because they, they feel comfortable as a community for the first few days. And then after they shed, which is about 10 days, they become very aggressive towards each other. They say, okay, we've, we, you've been with us now for X amount of days. You know, you've diminished our chances of being predated, like birds flying in flocks. And then once they get to a certain size or age, they go separate because the food resources are being co competed against. So I do mine if I don't have the room or too many babies at one time. I'll put them all together. They'll eat and feed communally quite well. But after the second, third, and definitely before the 10th day, um, when they normally shed, um, they're all individual because they'll start ripping tails and things off each other. Um, and then the, the, they're, and when I found them in the wild, they're never communally um, under 10 or anything, always single animals. They don't like each other's company. And I know people keep animals together, but I've always had disasters. They might be all right for a week or two weeks, and all of a sudden you come in and one's leg's missing, you know. And these were all things 
that you learned when you first started in the industry. They're savage, <laughs> real savage at certain times of the year. Um, so when people ask me, uh, do, should I keep them together? I always say no. Um, but then you see people keep them together. Um, um, when they brew made in the wild in Australia, I mean, is it singular or is it any hibernaculums or are you actually have multiple animals going to the same area? Well, all the ones I've found, they might be in the same area, but they're all on their own. Whereas blotches, though, they have been found communally. Yeah, they found and people keep them communally as well, and they don't have any issues with them. But um, syncoides, to a lesser de degree than the uh, intermedia, intermediates will just not tolerate each other at all. Sometimes you can get away with um, the Easterns having a pair together or um, a couple, but never two males together. And they will tolerate themselves until it's breeding time, and then females will turn on each other as well. Um, and one more breeding question, um, going back to males with um, um, smaller testicles, less sperm. Um, do they turn off when it's time to turn off, like in your opinion, or will some of these yeah, males well, that's, continue breed? That's why the data was so, so enlightening and why I felt that it had some some credibility was the time that they said that the testicles were at their most deflated or shriveled up stage was the time when mine were finished their breeding season. And I thought, yeah, well, that makes sense. And then they said they stayed deflated all through. So you have to equate our times with yours. Um, our summer starts in December, goes December, January, February. March, we have our autumn, March, April, May, and then June is our three months of winter uh, when they brew mate, and then August, September, October. Um, I know it's October, no September, October, November is our spring. Um, they, they'll come out of brumation around the last week naturally in August. So it's still cold in August, and I've got all my temperatures logged as well. It still gets down to three and four degrees during the night, sometimes five, and they will come out um, and be more visual and walk around during the day because it gets warmer. It gets to probably 23, 24. Now, all of my animals, um, and when you talk about males being lazy, when it gets over 26 degrees, my, my, my males won't. They have no appetite for mating at all. Whereas I see some videos where they're saying, oh, yeah, we've kept them at 35 and they're jumping through hoops. I don't find that. Maybe it's just my conditions. I don't know. But um, like I said, my pure easterns, they go from temperatures of zero in the winter up to like, what is it, 18 degrees during the day but when you see where they're hiding sometimes and you take a temperature of the the spot where the sun's shining it can be up to 28 29 degrees but and they'll stick their heads out but when when the night comes or the afternoon comes it gets bitterly cold here and we have frost here and the blue tongues are living in the frost you know they bury themselves down but i did an experiment where i put a glass tank um in a shed and it got down to zero and it didn't affect them at all okay um so are you keeping your males i mean everything's all happening in the same temperatures all together you're not doing anything different like males in one section or one building or one rack it's a mixture um, of every rack the way i originally set up the facility originally was a couple of rooms there was three or four rooms and then as um it became more of a business i then kept adding on rooms so i ended up with like eight rooms the newest baby facility is one big one big 24 meter by five meter room so um where everything is in under the same temperature 
with the males and the females, the rooms do vary by one or two degrees, but they have both sexes in them. And I've seen podcasts and people saying, well, um, will the males sort of look for females? I find, and this is only my uh, belief, I find that it's the, the time of the year and the temperature of, of the outside that more so the time of the year that gets the males to start to start wandering because I've had them outside by themselves and they'll wander the same time without any females anywhere near them. So now I, I've put my rooms per, per morph, like I'll have, um, you know, 40, 50 cages, say just albinos. I'll have 50 cages, just all the hypermelanistic, type so it doesn't go by sex it more goes by morphs so it's easier to to do the mating because all of mine are color coded um so that i don't have any inbreeding at all um because my grandfather taught me that he used to breed the snow peas for shows and he had a color system where he could walk the room and do all his pairings or pollinations within an hour when I go through now and I have my my plan, I know exactly which males are related to which female. I know exactly what genes they've got them all through a colour system. And what I say to my customers when they're buying my stuff is that don't throw the card away because if you want f future lines off me, just take a photo of that colour chart and I'll give you something that's not related or only marginally related. So that's how I, I, I've done it since day dot. I know all my lineages. I know exactly where they came from, who was, what their line is, so that if something amazing does show up, I can track it back. It's no point producing, you know, a purple animal and thinking, well, how the hell did that get produced? I know exactly how or what, what, uh, colors you know come out of uh, that particular pairing or that particular lineage and sometimes like happened with the rainbow albinos uh, uh rainbow larvas i sold it to a really not good colleague of mine five years down the track he's produced this amazing morph and i could track back all right we can make that again by just using that female and that male from that lineage Rather, and so it works. And the color coding for me works even beyond my facility for people who have bought my stuff. And they, they, they can. I can recreate something that I'm, was. You know, a lot of things are accident. You know, you you have all these theories and all these expectations, and sometimes the wildest, most beautiful animal is a freak that you weren't planning on. Platinum is a classic example. So it's good to, to have a system where um, your genetics can go beyond your facility. Um, I mean, you guys are extremely lucky to have the color palette you guys have in that species. I mean, I will say that, you know, what we're seeing in the United States over the last 10 years in Northern Malone have been extraordinary i mean we've gone so far with so many different lineages and i feel like we've barely scratched the surface on that but um you know i'm sure everybody in the or at least over here has always wished to have all that we have our own little slice that we enjoy doing but um you know to have true genetics backing it up not so much line bred traits like we have it just completely changes the game but what you gotta realize uh, we've only got four really four base genes uh, now maybe five uh with the pied but really we've only basically got four base genes and when people ask about oh, how can you get a pure orange out of you know something that was originally brown you can see the evolution of that even in our climate like we get a lot of bushfires here and um dry periods which might last 10 15 years and you can see the changing colour of the natural populations because the ones that are brightly coloured or don't fit into the, the landscape, they get predated out. And that's the natural selection. What we're basically doing, people are saying, oh, you produced mutts and whatnot. All we're doing is someone's given us a, a, 
a blank canvas and given us five or six colors and say go go for your life go broke and, and paint us a masterpiece that's all you're doing all the animals in the wild have that palette of color in them but you have to be able to get the right combinations to, to produce that masterpiece and that's the challenge every year i say breeding time for me is like an, uh, another christmas i love it because theories and strategies that you you've been thinking about for the whole year you can put into practice and then when there's people say yeah i'm a blue tongue breeder and all they've done is bought three animals off me and thrown them in a cage together that's not a breeder to me a breeder to me and there's only a few here in australia are visionaries that like i always say every road has a destination or has to have a destination so you're not just creating these things on a whim you're thinking about the genetic side of what you've learned and then you may yeah you may have some projects which are testers to see what happens a lot of them go nowhere but a breeder is not someone who gets two animals throws them together and produces a litter so i'm a breeder that's not a breeder from in my in my view it's someone who can analyze because i used to breed koi as well and japanese they, they produce the most beautiful koi because they know what they're looking at they know what to see you and i look at them and we think oh that's just a shitty fish but they can see the small traits and that's sort of learned over time and with the genetics that's the same thing we like when we produce the first larvas like joe ball produced the first larvas and they were beautiful as babies but as they mature just a straight eastern albina to a straight hypermelanistic they look shit i wouldn't feed them anymore basically uh if i had them so i've got some there which i do feed uh just a term um they they lose all their color and they look like oh it's a they're ghastly the albinos are far nicer than them so then what we did was okay let's layer this genetics and so what we we did with the four gene and the three gene animals you look at the larvas that are being produced now they're the brightest most brilliant orange that that you and you're getting 4k 5k for them you know because they're that magnificent color and they don't lose it but it's because the the genes and what you're putting into them you're layering them and again even with animals like that you can't just say oh yeah we've produced a larva or we've produced a platinum or whatever we're now in the process of going back and saying all right we're going to layer all these known morphs and improve on them and, and i i really say to people in the us and that if you want to make a larva and you're just going to put a hyper over an albino you're going to be bitterly disappointed and you're going to lose a lot of years try i know some of them won't have have a choice but the best larvas are produced from the four gene platinum line um over hets and that with with the platinum line in it so you my all my larvas go instantly so would joe's um because they're this bright orange you know they're but just hyper onto albino it just produces Beautiful babies, but really shitty adults. Yeah, I would have never have done that. So yeah, they're yeah. all the things that a lot of people won't come out with because they haven't gone down that road yet. And like I said to you before, be mindful if you're wanting to make four, four or five gene animals. If you've put a hypo or super hypo white northern um, into that lineage again, you're going to be like the Americans with their leucistic um ball pythons you're gonna get all white animals and yeah they'll have the genetics to produce other things in them but visually um like i've been trying now what is it six years to throw some of the genetics keep missing other people have done five and six years trying to produce the visuals it, you know 
what is it? One in 256 to produce a visual 4 gene morph. Now, a blue tongue gets 17, 18 babies at best. In that four genes, there's, what is it, 16 different combinations that you're trying to throw. You've got Buckley's of getting, some people have, you know, in Bowers and I've taken 10, what, what was that guy who produced, I, I saw it recently, it took 20 years to produce a multi-gene particular Bower he was after because you're rolling the dice every time. And um, the way to, to to lessen the odds, of course, is not putting two hats together, but you have to create all those three gene and four gene animals and then throw them together before you can go down that path. And this is what people don't really, they, they want you to sell them, you know, a three and four gene visual for the same price as, as you know, a normal animal. And you say, like, you're looking at 10 years worth of work here. And that, that's the only um, sort of the real drama I have because they look at it, oh, yeah, it's a, it's a col this colour and that. They don't see the amount of work in it. But as more breeders get on, the lower end, as we call them, the lower end, like the albinos, the hypers, single gene, nothing of that gets any price anymore unless it's multi-gene now. So five years ago... You're getting a thousand dollars, fifteen hundred dollars for a hyper. Now, even multi-gene hypers, you're getting eight hundred dollars probably for. So, the evolution of the morphs continues on, and um, the biggest problem I've seen is the multi-gene animals aren't commanding the big money that the whole, the effort and work that you've put into them. Now, on your multi-gene animals, how much uh, inbreeding are you trying to do? Or do you go, you know, two generations and stop? Or Well, with, with the genetics that I've done on, on blue tongues, they will inbreed on the second generation. And what I mean by that is you start getting deformities, you start to get a higher percentage of slugs. So, again, you know, the race to the top or the race to the bottom, they race through, they produce one litter of four gene hats, and then they breed them to death. And you're getting animals which um, have short, stumpy tails. You get, uh, we call them uh, fish eyes. Um, you get uh, ones that are born with their tongues, so they die because they can't eat. You get animals that have shark mouth. Um and a lot of the breeders out there won't ever um, say that they've had that. And I've had it in just one generation. So rather than racing to the bottom and producing four gene animals and having seven animals to work with, um, people said to me, oh, why haven't you produced, you know, all these four gene stuff visuals? I said, because... I'm still in the process of making. So I've got five different genetic lines that are completely unrelated um, to, to breed this year um, to make four gene combinations. But to get those five lines, it's taken four years. So, yeah, I could have had them three years or four years ago, but to what end? Those animals that have now been sold the only way you can produce any more four gene animals is to get an outbred line. So they've bought them all from the same breeder and they're, they're already seeing the devastation it's causing to their litters. So again, I've taken the time and now I've got five lines of four gene animals that are completely unrelated. So now I can put those together. And again, this is where the colour coding comes in and so beneficial. I can make totally unrelated four gene animals. And they're all 100% heads because they're made from two visuals um, that had the four gene, different four genes in them. Okay. I think we're running into um, very similar things here with um, Northerns. Um, I mean, from personal experience, I've noticed that some of my sunset lineage animals are more of my pure sunsets are smaller. Um, you know, I've noticed with some of the red lines, we have a little bit of an underbite. Um, and I've also noticed with some of the caramel stuff about five or six years ago was so inbred that, 
know, I thought structurally they just weren't very strong as babies. Um, almost looking like some were born with metabolic bone disease in a way. Um, you know, it just seemed like they walked a little funny. Now that could have had other things to do with it, but that was something I noticed with that. So I will say now that directions have been made in the United States, I do think there will be a period of correction, um, you know, outbreeding to then rebreed back to kind of what we're doing. But, you know, a lot of our strives have been keeping these lineages very tight and we've done a lot in a short period of time. But I think long term, we're going to have a lot of stuff to do for the structural um, parts of the animal. Yeah, and, and that that's the inevitable part. Like, I've always, like if I've said, I've been in this game, what, 30 years? And I, I, I'll i put it like I was basically brought up in an era where, you know, that they invented the uh, mobile phone in my lifetime. Um we used we didn't even know what a calculator was when i was going to school they came out when i was about 11 or 12. same with the internet it was all new to me and my kids like my daughter's 19 my son's 16. they're the ones who set all this up as alex would know <laughs> he had to set up this uh, internet thing because it was just not part of our system and until recently everything i put scribbled down in books you know and i still do it because i don't trust the computer systems in losing all my data um and that's the same with with the the color coding um we've always done things to leave no stone unturned type of thing and i'm not one who wants to be standing on a ped pedestal and people you know posting a, a a stamp on my phone i don't give a shit about that because in the mornings when i wake up I look at myself in the mirror and I say, yeah, I'm happy with what I see. Um, I don't need uh, sugar blown up my ass, as the term here goes. I do things because I enjoy them and I want others to the, to enjoy the animals the way I do. Um, I've seen so many scoundrels in this industry where, you know, they couldn't give two heats if the thing died two days later. It's just a quick cash grab and they're out of it. But... There's enough good people in this industry here that um, keep us pretty pretty well well on the right path. And the other thing is, is that the good thing here is, is that there's some that think, oh yeah, if we produce this, we're gonna be ahead of him and him and him. And whereas I see the evolution of everybody holding and keeping and breeding blue tongues is a positive thing because it says that a couple of breeders here in Australia have produced an animal or a product that everyone wants. And that's that's where I get a lot of pleasure from as well. And I always say to people, here, have, look at this, um, this you know, um, rainbow larva and look at this wild type. This is where we've come. You know, in a fairly short period of time. And a lot of people here in Australia as well, they don't even, they, when I show them, um, say people who are not in the industry, show them that this is actually a blue tongue, they don't believe it. They say, under those horrible brown things that you see running around your yard. So they're the things I get pleasure from. And, um, you know, I'm not in a race. I'm not in a in a rush to do anything because it's got to be done properly. If you're not going to do it properly, don't do it at all. Simple as that. And you've got to, like the people use the word passion. You know, I don't, it's not it's not passion. Mine's become a lifestyle. It's an interest. Yeah, there's a passionate part of it, but um, that's why I'm so proud of my kids because they respect animals and they're good people. Um, people who abuse animals and don't look after them. I've always found a, a pretty grubby purple. So the animals to me give me sanity. You know, every day you, you used to have to, like I ran businesses, I ran production lines, stressful as the animals gave me sanity. But just as they give you sanity, sometimes you also, you've got to get out and that's why I keep, keep part-time employment because i can you know associate with people um not just animals <laughs> all the time and i enjoy it i don't go to shows anymore because 
Um, here we don't have very many. I know in America they have a show every week almost. Uh, here we have two in New South Wales for the whole year. And, you know, it becomes a bit of, it's good to introduce people, yes, to the industry, but a lot of people that come to the shows here, they've either pre-bought everything from me anyway or it becomes a petting zoo um, where you're just a, you know, they, they pay $10 to come to one of the shows and it's a good weekend to take their children out. And I, I have major issues with biosecurity and things like that. Um, so I choose not to go anymore, but... It has to be advertised somehow, and I, I, you know, give full praise to the people who go to the shows, but it's not not a scene for me anymore. Um, yeah, and then you'd have incidences where you turn your back and they try to steal an animal, and it just took the enjoyment away from it. But in America, I think they run a little bit differently. But um, yeah, it's just it's a massive job as well to set up for a show you know as you would know yourself you you pack a hundred animals and um you know you don't really want to bring any home because you think oh god they all got to go into quarantine now um for a period of time because they've been out in an environment that could potentially have something that will um that will make them sick yeah yeah and that's the hard well no, no, I'm sorry. You go ahead, buddy. Trust oh, me. I was going to say that is the hard part with shows. There's, you know, a lot of benefit to them, getting new people in it. But then, yeah, there is not always the best vendors at some of them, and they're bringing wild-caught, sick animals, and then you got to worry about your collection getting mites or worse. It's It's hard, but, like, Dave does a lot himself. It I think a lot of times, at least here, it outweighs the bad, the good. Uh, well, I wouldn't tiptoe around it. I mean, we go through a lot of precautions, um, like he's saying, quarantine, um, you know, certain cleanup before and after the shows, so on and so forth. Um, you know, not allowing people to hold stuff at every show, so on and so forth. Um, I mean, as soon as you leave, things can go wrong. Um, you know, I don't take holdbacks to the shows. I I know a lot of people like to take like their best of the best to show everybody, but I don't see any reason for those ever leaving this place. Um, you know, I care too much about it. God forbid something goes wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I've got nothing against them. It's just not because people are asking me all the time. Oh, we don't see it shows anymore. I said, yeah, in 2020 I'd open up surgery, but that didn't stop me. It felt like I'd been run over by a truck about 50 times, but um I got over it in the first year and I was back into it again. Um, you know, the Blue Tongue's never suffered. I've got a good team of people here, uh, which are all family, so they, they're well trained to look after anything if I'm not there. And, um, yeah, after a couple of months, I was back into it and I even expanded. So, yeah, they, they've got to try more than that to kill me off, but... Um, yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoy the industry and there's nice people. It's like society, there's nice people and grubby people and that you just have to accept that. Um, yep. But, you know, the, the, the grubs who try to deter me from this, and I'll never do it because I'm not in it for them, I'm in it for myself and I enjoy the animals and I can see the joy that I've brought to a lot of people that thought they would never have a four-gene hat and now they have. Yeah, you know, I've done all the work for them, and I, so have some others, but I can only speak for myself. And, you know, and when they get something like a hypermelanistic um, or a multi multigenetic uh, animal that they thought they'd never have, you know, that gives me joy as well. But one of the areas that I won't and will not ever uh, road, I won't go down is doing absolute price dumps um, on good quality stuff just because, you know, you need to sell it for space. Don't breed it if you don't have space um, because what, what happens is you create 
a mindset for the people, they'll see the last price point. They'll never see it when the economy or the circumstances change. And the other, like if you take a hypermelanistic down to 300 bucks, they'll remember that $300 forever. They'll never remember the 800 and you'll never be able to bring the price up again. And the other thing is, is that I find that if people have paid more for an animal, um, justifiably so because of the quality or the genetics, they will basically sleep with the animal. If it's too cheap, they'll treat it like garbage and, um, you know, not take, take the um, precautions and the care and interest as though as they would with a quite like an expensive animal and you know every everything's different but that tends to like if you buy a two dollar guppy you know you're not going to treat it as you know a thousand dollar buddy from toza or whatever you know if it dies i'll go and buy another one and that mindset is what i try to change that it's an animal it's a living animal and you've got to look after it properly. Yeah, um, I I don't want to take away from it, but again, um, your guys' problems are no more different than our problems, no unique in any way. Um, everything you're saying is exactly what we have here with personalities in the hobby. You know, I'm personally one of these guys that, um, you know, I enjoy my bubble. I enjoy the people I have around me. I enjoy those conversations. You know, I like doing things like this, but, um, you know, I keep a lot of it close to the heart. I don't always show up what we're working on. You know, I do a lot of this for me. Um, and it's beneficial, you know, when I finally get to sell certain things, whether it's through a pet or an investor on an animal. Um, but I've found over the last at least two or three years, staying in my lane, enjoying what I do, kind of ignoring all that stuff in the background just makes everything more pleasant. I don't have to explain myself. I enjoy it more. But yeah, everything you're saying is exactly what I go through. And I think every other breeder in this industry goes through regardless of what country you're in. Yeah, I understand that. I, I sort of try and keep in my lane, but my heritage and the way I was brought up, I get pretty fiery. So I, I speak my mind. I call a spade a spade and it doesn't get me many friends at times. But people that do know me know they'll never get ripped off by me and they know what I say is what I mean. Like, we're, because we were from German heritage, we'd come to school, we'd get beaten up every day, a uh, Nazi killer and whatnot, and it made you tough. You fought your way out of every situation, out of every every situation on the buses or whatever. And um, as a child, you know, five years, six years old, you couldn't understand that. So we became good fighters and we, we looked after ourselves. Um, these days it's so different, so different. So, yeah, if someone steps on my foot, I'll, I'll be stepping back, don't worry about that. But everything that I do is transparent. Um, I don't make up stories. I don't make up, you know, fantasies about where things came from and lie to people about where they came from. Um, like I said, I call a spade a spade and I don't go on podcasts much because um, there, there's not really that much new in the hobby and people who want to know about genetics um they're few and far between they get want to get into real detail and that's why i post most of my stuff um and show them what i've created for, by by mating whatever but yeah you know, i enjoy i've enjoyed this podcast i've enjoyed some i, I did a thing for herp and time radio but I'm not doing this to, um, you know, get more sales work because I don't need the sales. Um, I do it because people learn from me as I've learned from them. You know, simple little things. Um, like, for instance, my little blueies, uh, when they're babies, they primarily eat insects. So some of the fussy eaters, um, which are very few, you know, if I buy crickets or um, woodies, that that gets them started. You know, they see the movement, they're into them, and then they'll start eating your normal diet. Uh, things like that. They, um, you know, they, 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 they're they things I learn from other people. I try them. The movement side, the breeding side, you know, I've imparted what I do with the albinos. Um, 
other people say, oh, well, we put the male with a female, I put, you know, female with male. It depends on the individual animal. Some of them, some of the real, um, what do you say, temperamental males that are frightened of females, I never put the f him into the female's cage because he's got all his scent and all his urates and whatever in his cage and if you introduce her to him he's more likely to be cage aggressive and and not run up walls but that's the other thing there's some males that will run up walls and poo themselves and race away for three four seasons and then all of a sudden it's like you click the like flick the switch again and they'll become an aggressive mater like every animal has its own sort of timeline from when it wants to breed and they're not all the same and you've got to watch your animals i check my animals every day and um yeah i i see what which ones are aggressive what times of the year they're aggressive why they're aggressive when they're just being cage defensive because they want to get fed or whether they're hormonal and uh, that's the enjoyment I have out of them. Um, so I know where you say this isn't necessarily for you. I'll be honest. I'm sure Alex will agree. This is probably one of the more beneficial conversations I've ever had on skinks. Um, you know, there's yeah. definitely a lot of things that um, I'm going to look at a lot different going into my next season. And I will be honest, and I'm sure Alex would be all about it too. Um, you know, when we start putting our animals in cooling, you know, a lot of us are starting to bring them out around December, January. Um, you know, I'd love to do this again in like October or November to where, you know, new things that you had noticed over even the past few months, we can maybe translate into what we're doing here because I'm going to have to take a lot of notes because there's going to be a lot of things that I might try to tweak this year based on this conversation. The only thing that horrifies me, and there's people that will testify as being successful, is this whole uh, shutting down the complete room and lights and everything and, and keeping those animals in pitch blackness for three or four months. Um, like I said, from the wild animals that I've studied and from seeing my animals, um, it just doesn't happen. The wild animals come out and um, enjoy the, the meagre sunshine they have. Not every day. Sometimes they might not, if it's cold, they might not come out for three or four days. But they will always, even if it's just sticking their head out, uh, to re, I call it recharging their batteries, they will come out. And nowhere in any of the blue tongue habitats that I know is there perpetual darkness for three or four months of the year. They don't live in the South or North Pole, wherever it is. Um, they get really warm days. They... Um, Brew mate in areas that can heat up in the in the winter quite quickly, and they do sun themselves um, in the winter time. They're not they're, they're not hibernating. They're brew mating. They're coming out. They're getting water. They need water. So um, even if you're brew mating your skinks, you need to have water there. They come out regularly to drink. They won't eat, but they'll come out regularly to drink and they'll also pee. So under my my um, mats, I've got the puppy pads and all you have to do is lift the the, the, the grass mats up and you'll see that they've, they've peed in there, um, you know, during, during the brumation period. Yeah. So now, it, I know it, the people that shut them down still have water and stuff. I guess, how could they do it different? Would they cool the room some while still offering them some heat during the day? Do you think would be better method? Yeah. So in America or areas of, of the U S you have in the winter time, you'd have snow and a probably minus 30 or something here where I live. I can pretty much follow the, the climate of the area. But mine still are probably five degrees hotter during the day than they would be outside or maybe even more. Um, but the night times when that's when everything goes off. 
try to regulate your day temps to um, the wild temps, which I do. I have a sensor on the outside of the facility which um, turns off the power um, when it's day and night. And um, they go through a very cold night. Sometimes it'll get down to five and six degrees inside, um, whereas outside it'll be minus one or minus two. What you've got to understand in the wild, they will not just lay out on the grass and get one or two degrees. They usually try to hide themselves in an area where the minimum might be two or one degree. And this is the Easterns I'm talking about. With the Northerns, pure Northerns, they they tend to get uh, about eight to ten degree nights in their natural habitat. They get 40 degree days, even in the winter time. So um, they brew mate. They sort of have a, a partial brew mate. They don't eat, but they have like a partial brew mation where they're out and about early in the morning and then it gets too hot for them. So... Then, then the nights get bitterly cold there as well. And that happens to a lot of the desert species. But the Easterns, because I live in the habitat, it gets bitterly cold here. You can get, I've had minus five, minus six here, and every year you still see them coming out of brumation. They're, they're still running around. So they're finding areas like my shed and digging down under lot fallen logs and whatnot in the wild, and they keep, probably one or two degrees, three degrees. So when people say in the US they're not taking their easterns below 15 degrees, it's way too hot. And that's why they had so many problems with the uh, diamond pythons because they live around here too. So you've got to remember they're getting down to one and two degrees as well. And you'll find little babies under shale um, splinters off rock and <clears throat> you lift them up. <clears throat> and on the western face, you'll see see a baby curled up under that, and it's getting one and two degrees. So, okay. I think a lot of times we spoil our, spoil some of the the wild types. So um, we always say, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Um, you know, while asking certain things about how you cycle lighting through the brumation and everything else. Um, you know, I do think there's some importance on that. You know, I've read these guys in different altitudes, different states around the country with different temperature. You know, we have the Florida guys like um, Tiki Geckos just starting to breathe their northern now where a lot of people, their season's over already. I um, mean, you, know, you kind of adapt to the environment that you're in. Um, and, you know, personally, you know, I had one year I couldn't cool them down as much as I wanted, and I focused on darkness. You know, I had other years where I feel like I did completely different temperatures of the species when I was further up north and I had colder temperatures in the wintertime. And we've always kind of found a way to make it work. Um, you know, I think it's a lot of the tips that you're giving after bringing them out of brumation, temperature control while breeding your animals. Because I know a lot of people here fired up to, you know, maximum temperature on the heat pad, you know, get up, let's go, it's time to breed. Um, you know, where it seems like with you, you're talking about more of a very slow dial up and even lower temperatures than we would typically do or even think about doing while breeding them. Mm. Yeah, uh, here um, a lot of people want to get a jump on the market as well. But what they don't realize here in Australia is, and this is where a lot of them go wrong, they say, okay, we're going to breed them in, in July so that we we have them on the market by November or for Christmas. People don't buy animals at Christmas here because they go on holidays. And then they've got this tiny little baby, blue tongue or whatever, and no one's there to look after it and it either perishes or it goes backwards. Here in Australia, and it's probably the same or different in America, they really don't start buying big for me anyway, is about end of February because school goes back beginning of February here and then um, the kids want, you know, things to come home to defeat and whatnot. Um, so your lower, your lower value morphs or lower priced morphs, let's say, they won't sell for me until end of February. And then, you know, they've got up to a reasonable size. And the other thing like the pet shops and the pet market don't want big animals. They want small animals so that if it's a new beginner that doesn't, um, is not familiar with the animal or if, you know, they're a bit nippy, 
it's better getting nipped by you know a month old or two month old baby than an adult so they won't take any adults at all um they prefer the smaller the better as long as they're strong and um you know active and have no health issues but getting the jump yeah you might get bigger animals and they'll only be beneficial to breeders and that but uh from a purely marketable animal that they, they, they don't sell until end of february so i mean that's you have an understanding of your market i'm sorry yeah so that's our market um america might be totally different they might want the blue tongues the minute they're born here they don't unless it's something brand new and then you mostly get investors or breeders who want them it seems and like, like most pet people are okay with getting them pretty soon here at least you know once they're safe to go to new homes yeah but your your um when you birth your blue tongues that's not anywhere near christmas or that is it no yeah mine aren't born till you know march april yeah and so, when the tax return season is when our babies are born, when people typically will spend a little more money in the United States. Like you said, the holidays, people put all their money into vacations, family, and gifts. They don't really think about their hobbies or their pets. Yeah, so ours are born, you know, at, at best beginning of November. Most of mine are born um, December, some in Jan, early January. Um, and that's the holiday season here. Business is shutting down. People are going on annual leave or holidays and they don't come back. And our school year finishes about the 20th of December and it runs through till usually end of January or the 1st of February. So that period, they're all on vac vacation or the other parents are going crazy trying to um, take kids to the shopping centres or the zoos and whatnot. They're not, like I've done this for 20 years, I know. They don't buy in these periods. And if they do, it's, you know, few here, few there. And then they come back in January, oh, Johnny forgot to look after this one. Um, can I get another one? You know, it's because we were, we were he was riding his bike in the sun or he, he forgot he had it or we went on annual leave or holidays. So, and then the other thing is, is that, whether people want to believe it or not. Um, you know, there's certain ethnic groups that have New Year's, which are in January and things like that, and they won't, they're on holidays as well. So you're looking about two or three months where no one wants to buy much because they've got holiday on their, on their mind. They're overseas or, you know, spending their money on, on vacation. So it's important for people to also realise, you know, how your market operates as well if you've got something brand new yeah they'll buy it the day you you release it but um <clears throat> the general the general consensus for sales for me and i see it with a lot because they start to panic because they've got all these babies that they're feeding and can't sell i said just wait till february you'll be fine and then they're okay not everybody notices those things going on around them. Um, you know, people think there should be more consistency in the market. But, um, you know, when you start paying attention to a lot of other things you're looking at, that's something that I've always paid a lot of attention to. I based my show schedules around things like that. Um, you know, it seems like every year it's the same routine if you pay attention to what's going on around you. Yeah, and what, what happened with the shows here a few times is, like, they'll have very late. The second show is always very late, and my animals are – uh, have been paired up, you know, or they're in brumation. Um, so there's no way they're going to get disrupted to go to a show. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the shows are that early that you don't have anything up to size to sell. So, yeah, it's, it's knowing your market and um, not panicking and not under undervalu uh, undervaluing your work. Um because I see it now in America, they're really panicking with the ball pythons. But the guys that have got the good quality or the high end stuff, they they're dropping it a little bit, but nowhere near 
um, the same as the guys with their bread and butter lines. No, um, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, you're right. Oh, I was going to say, um, you are right on that. And I will say, um, you know, a lot of times this, um, you know, if you follow the trends in the economy, um, you know, species that are heavily worked with in the United States, you will start seeing a fluctuation in price. Um, the stuff that's not as heavily worked with, you know, this stays a lot more consistent with price. I um, mean, you know, that could be based on their community. I think a lot of this is based on supply and demand. Um, and then, you know, I always say sometimes a correction. Um, you know, some of these prices get really high here and there needs to be a correction. Not everybody can jump in at a certain price point. Um, but again, you know, there's a mirror image of ball pythons and that community and how that market works and how blue tongues work for you over there. Like, again, I can make a comparison story to everything you said to something ball python related here. Yeah, so I've warbled on enough. If Like, I, I could talk for hours on blue tongues, but there's certain things that, you might have issues with or doing things differently um, that you might want to ask me or is there anyone who wants to ask anything? I, um, I can I cover so many topics, but it would st I'll be here forever. Um, I think you covered a lot of the stuff that people asked. Yeah. I will say attention spans could be um, the issue with these podcasts. I love these long format podcasts. You know, when I did St. Pierre back in the day, it went over three hours um, because, you know, the conversations keep going. Um, I'm sure Alex might be thinking the same thing, not because we're not enjoying ourselves, but usually when you hit the three hour mark, that's when people start phasing out. Yeah, um, yeah. So long you can listen, but I'm sure Alex will agree, man. I, I would love to do this again because I think we could do another three hours of this very easily. All I say is, um, with, since you're getting into the ivory or whatever you like to call it, never, and I say never, put white onto white. I know the people see the dollar signs and they see, oh, yes, I'll get a litter of 15 whites. You'll get a litter of three or four completely mangled and mutilated animals and you'll get the rest slugs. Interesting. Um, never breed a visual white to a visual white. And um, it, it'll cause you know, a lot of grief and a lot of headache because, and that's the other thing that sort of um, verifies to a degree that it is like a codom or a super form because a lot of the super forms in snakes and that, they don't, they don't even make it out of the egg. And um, for years, people were just constantly putting white on white and having zero results. Um, then I saw one, oh, yeah, look, I had 15 babies. I put white on white. And as they, a couple of weeks after they they were born, you'd see the bottom jaw becoming like a crocodile. Like they had so many issues with them. And, you know, you'd hear people say, oh, I'll buy them and I can breed it out because they were actually giving them away. So you'll never breed it out. So always with things like the what I say, the co-doms and that, Put head to head to visual or lines that um, like with the hypers, you can put multi gene animals over them from a different lineage, and you'll have so like I put if I want to produce hypers, I'll put platinum over a hyper. That way, all the babies will be a hundred percent head platinum, and you'll produce you know hypers in as a as a side entity of that as well then it works yeah you know, putting a visual to a visual but they're not a, i i still maintain they're never as strong as a head to a visual and uh it takes longer yeah but you know if you want to speed down the road um you're not going to be as successful well um, who knows how inbred the ivories already are here is you know, as many that got whipped out quick and they dropped you, it's probably better to outcross them and go for strength instead of quickness. Well, if you put an ivory and an ivory over there, I can guarantee you um, that you're going to have issues. Well, so if you're paying 7000 or whatever they paid for them, we, we're lucky to get 1000 from them unless they're multi-gene. Um, 
you're going to have um, far better results like I did at the beginning. I put 16 girls over, which were just hats, nothing else. Pick your strongest, most um, um, vibrant hat, something that has no medical issues, no... Uh, is a beautiful, big, strong animal. Can be multi gene if you want, but produce your first generation of of hats first. If it's a new morph like that, with me, I can put a white over a platinum and produce, you know, fifty percent um, whites out of that that litter. I can put, you know, some of my three and four gene animals over and produce a percentage of my, uh, hypers, whites, albinos, but they're they're always a hat in head form so um that's just my advice people do what they want to do um i've seen in china some of the breedings they've done have been absolutely miserable because they want quick money they want quick return and um some of their results have been absolutely miserable yeah. by oh, putting visual to visual uh yeah, so we that's it we got one question from Josh. He asked if you breed any Easterns outdoors in the past, uh, if you saw any advantages keeping them outdoors versus indoors. I have got some pure Easterns outside because these were wild animals. And one's an albino, which was um, from Snake Ranch, which always had them outside. It will not drop babies if it doesn't go down below five um the benefits of outside is um say say in breeding time they get you know they get roughed up and they have a a gash on their side in the natural uv the damage done to an animal or if they have a sore or anything seems to heal far quicker in natural uv the only the, the the disadvantages are you have no controlled environment and some of the ones outside um won't drop babies till middle of january because they it's so cold and they come out a lot later um the other thing is they're very skittish they're they're frightened of the outside and so you've got all the greenies who are saying you know oh, they need to be in their natural habitat they live a life of stress in the wild and i know that's where they um evolved from but yeah i have to feed them inside their hide outside they won't eat outside um they're very skittish the minute i open the back door and they're you know, 10 yards away, you see them race inside. So you can't really enjoy them as much as indoors because indoors they're just lazing around looking at you, coming up to the cage. They know it's you that's there. Um, it's mainly a temperature thing with the Easterns. Um, you need to brumate them a lot lower than the, the Northerns. So, you know, anywhere built like... I reckon eight and below you need to go to to successfully breed them. Some people probably have pr produced them um, at higher temperatures, but then I always wonder: has it got an influence, bit of influence from northern, or is it, um, you know, some something that because the, the easterns have such a massive range, you can get them into Queensland, and it, does, it never gets that cold in Queensland. So knowing your locality of where the original stock came from is important as well. If you go down to Victoria, it is bitterly cold for six months of the year, whereas in um, the eastern populations that are far north, they would take temperatures almost like, like a, a northern. And where you get the uh, easterns on the Queensland border, I've bred them at you know, 15, 15 minimum. But the pure easterns from the coastal fringes, from, say, the southern highlands down, they need to be cold. So, yeah, it's trial and error again because the ones in America, you wouldn't know where their their locality was when they, um, when they were imported. No. No, and even if any of this older stock might have been crossed, even like an Indonesian at some point, I'm sure that's going to change everything. 
I'm sure what region in the country animals are produced are going to put them on maybe a different timeline, possibly. Um, I feel like me personally, you know, I've bought adults over the years and have never truly cycled with my collection. Um, but, you know, if you raise your own animal in your own conditions, you're going to be better off because it's used to that. And I'll, I'll send you the link about the, uh, the, the sperm production and that. And you'll see um, that the interesting thing about the brumation is the release of hormones that actually start the testicle and the meiosis of the sperm. And that's where if I think if they don't get cold enough in certain localities, because all the different localities, I call it them having antifreeze in their blood, they all have different levels of antifreeze. And um, a northern, if I put a northern outside, it'd be dead the first week of winter because it gets too cold here. Interesting. Well, I wanted to thank you, Roger, for coming on and, you know, giving us three hours of your time. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I Like, you've got to stop me when you want to stop talking because I'll keep going for a, for a year. <laughs> and there's so many things I haven't even touched on yet. Um, but, you know, it is what it is. So like, you know, food and the things that people feed there and all that sort of stuff. It just horrifies me, some of the things that they feed them. But, yeah, it's been enjoyable. I I have this, like, I've, this is my first podcast, really. I've done some radio ones, but this is the first live one because I don't have a face for, I've got a face for radio, really. Um, yeah, so I appreciate I really appreciate you coming on, Dave, because... Uh, yeah, I followed you for a lot of years and seen all the different podcasts you've been on, and and I've always followed your stuff, Alex, because I, I you have truly done a great job with just line breeding different color forms and different color variations. You just could do a million things if you had some of the things we have here, and um, yeah, it's it's been enjoyable. I I thoroughly enjoyed it and good to meet you both again and yeah just watch my pages and uh the, there's always new stuff being updated as, as i get new results i i update them there um the website's a little bit slow because you know all the processes you have to go through with that but don't post as much as i used to on facebook but instagram and that's always got something on it well and you know i I have all your information in the description. If anyone, you know, that lives in Australia wants to contact you for babies in the future. But, yeah, uh, no problem. Thanks for that. Thank you both again. And you guys both have a great rest of your night. And like I say, anytime, Dave or Alex, you want to contact me, uh, yeah, it doesn't take long to send an email or a text or a phone call. Phone calls are more expensive. Some people, I don't know what the what the rates are over there. Here, they're as cheap as chips. But um, yeah, I'm always amenable to people wanting to ask me, but I give them the straight answer of what I do. Um, yeah, and then, then they have to use that information and try to um, to plug it into their system. I mean, I will take advantage. I'll be honest. Like I said, this was a great conversation. Um, you know, like I said, I, you don't hear this kind of information very often in skinks. So when you do, you got to appreciate it. So yeah, I'll be hitting you up every once in a while. I've heard your name passed around. And again, I appreciate the kind words too, man. Um, I mean, that means a lot. And I'm sure we're going to do this again, at least one or two more times. Yeah. yeah I, I would definitely think, like thanks to. again. I won't keep you that long. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Well, good to good to see you again like i said and um yeah until uh the my ticker stops i'll keep going so, as you should okay hopefully that's not anytime soon no well, you never know i feel pretty fit <laughs> <laughs> all right good to see you and thanks again all right take care well i think we we're supposed to walk away too I yeah. think he's still recording. <laughs>
Yeah, um, I know, right? The old guys are left over trying to figure this out. Best yeah. of luck, man. I'm going to leave you behind. Later. Yeah, I don't know.